Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sybil Taunton. I'm the new head of diversity, equity, and inclusion for RICS. And I really appreciate everyone showing up uh, both here in person with us at Great George Street uh, and to all of our uh, great attendees online, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Um, we do ask that everyone, if you haven't already, please scan the QR code for the Slido link. Um, that's where you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, it's also where you'll be able to take uh, part in our live polling throughout the event where we will be asking questions that are applicable to the panel discussions that are taking place today. Um, before we formally get started, um, I'm also obligated to read our health and safety requirements for this facility, so please bear with. Um, there are no planned uh, emergency tests today, so if you hear the fire alarms go off, it's not a drill. Um, and so we ask you to please make your way to the nearest exit, down the stairs, out the front, um, and meet at the uh, at Little George Street, adjacent to Parliament Square. Um, so if you have any questions, we'll have staff guiding people out the door uh, and, and find that open space. Um, toilets are down on the ground floor. We also have a gender neutral toilet facility if needed um, up here on, on this same floor. Uh, again, staff can guide you um, if needed um, for that. So again, thank you, welcome. Um, I am very excited to introduce our opening speaker He's our executive director for profession and advocacy. Uh, more importantly, he's a leader within the RICS organization that is a true ally. Um, he shows up, he turns up, he has the conversations, he listens, um, and he's actively involved. Um, and that's exactly what we need in all of our organizations. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Chris Alder to the stage. Thank you so much, um, Sybil. Uh, one thing from the health and safety announcement is for those that are joining online, we don't know what your arrangements are. So please, if there is a fire drill in your house or in your workspace, make your own way outside. Um, but, but first and primarily, thank you, Sybil. Um, later on in what I was gonna say, I was gonna introduce you to Sybil. A, a really important, I think, marker of our ICS activity is to be able to bring forward a new role as head of diversity, equality, and inclusion. Sybil is doing an absolutely incredible job in terms of advocacy within the profession, with the membership, but I think it's also a really important statement on behalf of RICS about really wanting to take a leadership role in this space and to be a clear advocate. But as, as Sybil has said, thank you so much for joining us, either here in Parliament Square or online. I think it's really important that the discussions we're going to hear, listen to, share and understand across the course of this afternoon will play a really important role in understanding but also advancing inclusion for LGBTQ professionals. And whether you are part of the LGBTQ community or are here as I as, as an ally, as a partner, as a collaborator, we are all in this together. We're all together trying to shape a more equitable and inclusive profession, a more equitable and inclusive industry, a professional community, and yes, a society. That sounds quite grand, but it's a task that falls to us to deliver. And some would say, well, why do we still need in 2022 an event like this? But some, even with the best of intentions, perhaps, wonder actually why RICS or this industry needs to showcase these kind of events. But we continue to face challenges from within the industry, from within the profession, and as a lawyer by background within professions generally, we face challenges from individuals and members who are concerned and challenge our open and outward support of the LGBTQ community through our communications campaigns and even through raising the progress flag outside the RSCS building here in Parliament Square. I'm absolutely committed that it's the right thing for us to do to be here and to share our understanding and raise understanding as to why these are important steps for us to take. People continue to be discriminated against and face disrespectful comments and actions incredibly sadly on a regular basis just for being who they are. And that's why, as I said, in 2022, we still need these events. We need events like this, and we need to continue to take proactive action. 
but we all must do better as a profession, as a professional, myself, as professionals and as society. It falls to us to work to end discrimination and bias. And very often the label is made or the comment is made that it's great to say fine words, it's great to show your intention, but what's crucially important is more about the actions that you take. And so for me, I just wanted to identify a number of factors and things that we are doing at RICS. Not only have we hired into a new role and will look to build the depth and breadth of the DEI role in RICS, but the RICS Governing Council, importantly, has established a strategic oversight group to work closely with civil and colleagues and to steer the DEI strategy for the organization, for the profession, for members, and to be a clear, visible leader in the industry. That group is chaired by Governing Council member Kath Mitchell, and she was very clear in stating, the future of the profession depends on greater commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's a pretty bold statement. The future of the profession depends upon the actions that we take in this area. Now that steering group is going to be appointing four experts to join the group, and it's gonna be a great opportunity for some of our members to be able to contribute, to be able to be part of that group, to help shape the future direction. RICS has also signed a memorandum of understanding with five other built environment bodies focused on diversity, equality and inclusion, <coughs> recognizing that actually we all have to come together and collaborate if we want to succeed in shaping a more equitable and inclusive built environment. And an action plan for this collaboration will launch in late July this year. We're also fully committed to getting the inclusive employer quality mark, IEQM, back on track and launch to support the many stakeholders and members who have patiently awaited it. This platform will serve as a valuable tool in aligning DEI objectives and sharing best principles, best practices across as many organisations that we can persuade to join. And finally, and importantly for me as an executive uh, member of RICS, we include diversity, equity and inclusion as a key strand of all of our corporate objectives to ensure that all of our teams, all staff, all activities across the organisation review all their current practices, policies and services to ensure that inclusion and accessibility is at the forefront of all that we do. As I've said, we're going beyond words, we're getting into action and as a very practical person, that's where I feel more comfortable. It's the doing actually that will make the difference. And it's the action that's gonna better support this industry, this profession, better support members, better support, as Kath Mitchell says, the future of the profession. It provides better support for our members and our employees. And it's encouraging to me to have seen so many stakeholders and members eager to collaborate and to help us move forward and drive progress together. But I stand here, I'm delighted to be on this platform, but I'm more interested in hearing and listening and understanding more about the challenges and work that we can do again to, to do ahead um, together through this afternoon session. I'm really looking forward to listening and learning with you all today. Sybil, thank you for this opportunity. Very grateful. Thank you, everybody. All right, we're going to shake things up a little bit on this one, and we're going to change the order of some of our panel discussions. Uh, and right now, we would like to welcome panel two up to the stage, uh, led by Natalie Patrick from JLL, uh, to have an, a discussion on the importance of visible role models. Good afternoon and welcome to panel two. I would like to thank the RICS for their continued commitment uh, to diversity, equality and inclusion. A personal thank you to Richard Collins, to Chris, 
and to Sybil and the team of people who made today possible. For those in the audience and for those watching online, I also thank you for your attendance. It is not lost on us that we have colleagues and RICS members located across various territories who may not have the opportunity to gather in this manner to discuss LGBTQI plus issues. Equally, I recognise that there was a time in the near past that this institution would not have held such an event. But this event here now represents progress and we are all a part of that moment. I often say that I am an employer's DEI dream as I tick at least four protected characteristics. Being a woman, a person of color, who is neurodiverse and often found watching Queer Eye on Netflix with her girlfriend. <laughs> FYI, she doesn't like Queer Eye. <laughs> In all seriousness, I have now come to accept myself and the many layers that make the whole. I understand all too well what it means to ensconce yourself for years and years in that cosy, not cosy closet. With that said, I also appreciate that we all have our own timelines on when we feel able to let people into our lives. Those who identify as LGBTQI plus understand all too well that coming out is a repeated event which can be filled with trepidation. Equally, there are some of us who brim with pride and self-confidence. Wherever you are in your journey, what is important is the presence and visibility of LGBTQI plus colleagues within our industry. So today, I am joined by a fierce panel of real estate professionals who advocate for LGBT visibility within the workplace and beyond. We anticipate by the end of this session, you will have a greater appreciation on the importance of representation and why LGBTQI role models are so important in our industry. Now I've bored you enough, I will turn to my panel members and ask to my immediate left if we can, in order, if you could introduce yourself and maybe a little snippet. Okay, <laughs> okay um, I'm Mark Bennett. Um, I'm not a member of the RICS, I'm a Charter Institute of Building um, member. I work for a company called BW Workplace Experts and um, I've, I'm co-chair of Building Equality, which is made up of 60 organisations um, basically looking at the LGBTQ plus community and how we can help within the industry to um, increase uh, awareness of and change attitudes across across the industry as well. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Kapanda. <coughs> I'm from BNP Paravar Real Estate. I identify as a gay cis male and I started and there was no visibility, which is why this is a big passion of mine. <coughs> I sit on the Pride UK um, Employees Network at my company, um, and I'm on the steer code for that. Business um, to expose and to be visible um, within the community and um, beyond. Hi everyone, I'm Rico Naylor. I identify as gay, and I joined JLL as a graduate in September last year. I was supposed to graduate in the glorious year of 2020, so it was a bit of a late start to the industry. Um, but I, while being in, in the job since September, I'm part of Building Pride, our LGBT um, ERG group, and our ICS Matrix in Manchester, and also um, the Futures Advisory Board for BPF. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Joe, Joanne, please call me Joe. Joe Towers from the Valuation Office Agency. Uh, I'm a member of the RICS and a fellow of the uh, CAAV. Um, I'm one of the lead agricultural valuers at the VOA. 
and uh, I'm also a volunteer in the diversity and inclusion networks at work. Um, that's the gender and the LGBT plus allies group. Um, I can't think of anything else to say, sorry. That's okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to be uh, pressing you for some more information as we go on. Okay, um, thank you all. Um, everybody that's on this panel is here because they're, they've done the work and they're doing the work. Um, and I'm very grateful that they're here today. Um, I'm going to go straight in and um, mark Kapanda. <laughs> you first. Okay. Quite a light question I think I'll start with. <coughs> the token gay right <laughs> harmful or progressive um i think there's two sides to this so the token gay in our society and film and entertainment is always the overly camp um friend of a female who advises on shopping and has fun and talks about relationships so do i think that is healthy um, I don't necessarily think so because our, my heterosexual colleagues perceive that as what is LGBT. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a constant battle to say, no, we're, uh, the community is diverse and we are just like you as well. Yeah. Um, a token gay in the corporate world, if you are pitching to a client and your business doesn't really have the diversity there, but yet you do have some pockets of diversity in the business and they recognise that they need to have a diverse panel to go forward to a client. And they ask you as a token gay to be on that pitch. I don't necessarily think that is harmful because one, they're recognizing that that, that diversity matters. Two, that they recognize that they don't necessarily have the diversity. And as long as then they implement plans to increase diversity, then I don't think it, it matters. And as long as my skills have also got me to that table, then to be honest with you, I will take position as a token gay to get in front of and be on a pitch, one to better my own experience as well. And we do have unique identifiers as LGBT community. And I think we also should be using those uh, um, unique identifiers um, to represent ourselves. Yeah. Um, and it, by doing that, you represent the community as well. So I think there's two, there's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. I think, um, for the wider society that always assumes that you are a heterosexual male with kids or family um, when that's not the case and those barriers need to be knocked down. So um, it, it depends whether a token gay is progressive or harmful. Yeah, there is, there is some value depending on the setting. Yeah. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. I'm just kind of leading from that. Um, I just wonder whether or not being the token gay, whether or not there is any pressure to overcompensate for being yourself. Perhaps, Rico, you're able to kind of pitch in with that answer. It's an interesting question. I think it's something that I have pondered before. And for me, I don't necessarily feel that in my current job I'm actively overcompensating, but I think something that I've kind of realised is that I think when you grow up with, you know, racism and homophobia, you know, talk about a double-edged sword, um, there is a certain lifestyle that sort of deviates from normality. And I feel like my first diploma was, you know, probably in getting white people to like me, for example, especially when I, you know, moved schools and experienced kind of racism and segregation, always wondered, you know, what is it about me that's so different? And then sort of navigating life after that, to the sort of sexuality stage of life. There's always that kind of trying to shine bright mm. in the preferred light, in the light that other people expect of you. And I think that that's always carried with me. It's not something that I consciously do. I just think when you're from sort of two minority groups, there's that, that you know, well, if people are going to see me and people are going to have opinions of me I want to have an influence over that so I think there's always that internalised overcompensation in that respect I certainly get that I think there's um, I think uh, there's a, a theory of double consciousness of just always just kind of being aware of the many parts of yourself and trying to fit those and shoehorn them into what is um, you know mainstream society um, with that, um, 
I would ask then Mark again, um, Mark C, why does this visibility then matter? Why is it important? Visibility matters. Well, let's go back a bit. When I started my career 10 years ago, there was very few out LGBT real estate colleagues or people I was aware of when I started my career in 2012. Um, so for me, I suppressed my identity and I didn't come out until I was 26. So until I, when I came out, then I decided I needed to be visible because if I've now gone through this trouble and for the anxiety I had when I was in the closet, that I needed to, to be part of being visible, being my authentic self. Um, and Gareth Thomas talked about um, being that, putting yourself out there, being the person or the people where you open yourself up for um, comments, yeah. to be fair. Um, whenever I do a talk internally or out externally, I always mention about the Pride UK networks and employee networks. And you do hear murmurs of, oh, they're, talk they're plugging the employee networks again. But I do think it's important to bring that down those barriers. Yes. And by me being visible and uh, making sure that I'm representing my community, it's bringing that conversation to, to that ground and, that, and, and you can correct those people. Yeah. Um, it, I'm lucky in being with Parable, we have some senior um, out um, executives. So one of them being Paul Avery. Uh, and he, when I joined the company five years ago, he was really the, the person that I would put as my visible role model and which then encouraged me to get involved with the Pride UK network and to do all the, the pieces I've done on, on the articles. Um, and that gave me the confidence and the grounding to then decide I want to be a visible role model. Because yeah. actually, one, you have to be okay with yourself and be happy in your surroundings and be comfortable to come out. And then that's the, the, the footing that then you're given in, in that comfort. Then you can then provide your voice uh, and project. And hopefully then coming through, the new generation coming through, they can see visible role models like myself and more senior visible role models and think, okay, this is a, an inclusive culture. And if I want to come out, I can come out. You don't have to come out. It's about creating an authentic, an authentic atmosphere and being, and being able to bring your authentic, your authentic self to work. Yes. And not all the time you want to bring your authentic self to work. Sometimes I just want to hide under the covers or <laughs> I want to work from home and don't want to talk to anyone. Absolutely. So uh, everyone has uh, pushes and pulls in their life. And some people want to be 100% out and work. Some people not necessarily and it's okay as long as that's your decision and the environment that you work in isn't a negative one yeah there has to be that scope for choice yeah absolutely and just kind of like just going back to a point you've made with regards with regards to executive leadership i'll just pose this question to mark bennett and just you know can you tell me what part in your opinion do you think executive leadership plays in if we are to revolutionize our workplace um, and you know, how do we begin to make our workplaces more comfortable and you know safe? I think, uh, <clears throat> from my point of view, I think it starts at the top, and you have to get everyone at the top has to buy into buy into changing attitudes and also changing the helping to change the industry mm -hmm. and to change people's approaches and uh, the way people think as well. And you need to educate, to start off with, you need to educate the executives. And then they then need to, what I've tried doing previously, and I've suggested previously in my previous company, was that the, it's done to the, the senior, all the senior managers and the directors. Mm -hmm. And then the directors then deliver what they've been delivered to down to the next level of management. And it sort of tumbles down. Okay. And... To me, it's all about educating. It is literally just about educating people and change to change attitudes, and also being willing to be a visible role model and, and also an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely. I mean, just ha if somebody is interested in being an ally, um, but there might be a little bit of fear. I mean, you're you're an advocate and an ally, both for, both for women in the workplace and for LGBTQI people. What advice would you give? to somebody who might be interested in be joining an ally program? Um, basically, do it. Um, ask, firstly, you need to ask yourself why you wouldn't want to be an ally. And 
you need to say uh, then the um, I suppose I've lost my train of thought now. If basically, what, if you're going to come out as an ally, mm -hmm. you, you're then going to possibly trigger somebody else to come out as an ally, and then it could be t a tumbling thing, like a row of dominoes, basically falling over. And just in in terms of allyship, um, Joe, do you, do you think um, some people say they're allies, but but they're silent allies? Do you think there's uh, harm in being a, a silent ally, or do you think it's important to be an active ally? Um, I think it's very important to be an active ally, um, not just when uh, we're in the room, but when, when we're not in the room, um, and to, to be unafraid to challenge inappropriate actions and behaviours. Um, I can give you an example of that, if that's right. Yes. Um, I used to work at our Nottingham office until um, February 2020, and when I, when I came out at work um, and started my social transition, socially, when I socially transitioned um, in January 2019, um, I worked alongside a, a mixed team of uh, fellow charter surveyors and, and administration staff. Um, and uh, it was May 2019, I, I remember this event. Um, uh, I just walked into work on a, on a normal day and uh, one of my colleagues came over to me and said, as I sat down and said, um, you weren't here last night, but um, one of your colleagues actually challenged uh, some inappropriate comments. Um, somebody had asked one of my colleagues why, why that man was using the, the women's toilet. Um, and they, they calmly said that actually uh, that's Jo, she's transitioning and she's got every right to use those, the, the women's toilets. Um, and the person who did that was, was Leslie. Um, and I think at the time she was a, an, administ an administration officer. So that's, uh, if you look at pay grades, that's next to one on the, on the bottom rung of the ladder. And there was nothing in, there were no brownie points to be gained by, by Leslie for doing that. I wasn't visible, I was, I'd, I'd gone home. But one of my colleagues pointed that out. So <clears throat> I made a point of, um, of going to see Leslie and thanking her uh, and giving a thank you card and said how important it was for our eyes to stand up and be counted. Absolutely. Absolutely. And those are the kind of tangible, what I call tangible receipts or rewards. Um, mm. And I think that's quite profound that somebody did that when you were not in the room. I think that speaks volumes. Um, Another question for Mark C. Um, <laughs> I've been involved personally in setting up um, in ERGs within a um, consultancy environment. Um, we're now in a position where we've got ERGs and networking forums and company policies. And these all represent really important, significant and necessary um, bits of infrastructure. But do you think we're missing something? Uh, what else do we need in order to kind of really help the progression and kind of bed in the fact that LGBTQI people are here, they're here to stay, they're a part of the workforce? Unfortunately, I think time. Mm -hmm. As people come through the business, as people, careers progress, you're going to have more, hopefully you're going to have more of a diverse opinion and a, an accepting culture coming through from the younger generation. I've always been an advocate for making sure we get, we're doing awareness and insight programs. Um, and we talk about um, gender gap as well. Um, and it's not a, uh, it's going to be fixed in a year or two years. It's not, no. it's going to be a five year, it's going to be a decade of continual progress. And even though you've set up, we've set up all those um, employee resource groups, so those employee networks, the policies, transgender policies. Um, we've just refreshed our transgender policy as well to help line managers, um, which, is, which is a great thing to, to have in place. And what came from that was actually the wording of those documents, to not make it a really hard read. It needs to be um, understandable. All the jargon needs to be sorted out. Um, so once you've got all those in place, it's, it, it's continual pushing and chipping. Yeah. So if you've got all the employee networks, well, what's your engagement like? 
So if your engagement has dropped off, okay, well, what can you do to re-engage? Um, so is there initiatives that you can run to make sure employees are engaging with your employee networks? Or have you identified reasons why there's less engagement? Um, it might be the fact that people don't really are okay now. They, they don't need to be part of the network to push forward their ideas. Um, That's true. So it'll be interesting to see from the data what the data is saying yeah. um, in terms of LGBT. Um, so yeah, really progressive, moving things forward, making sure engaged, there is continual engagement. And the big one that I think is, is, is visible role models. Yeah, absolutely. If I didn't have the courage to come out and see the visible role models, then I probably would still be in the closet. Yeah. So um, I think making sure visible role models are seen, that they're, they're doing events like this, they're talking to people, uh, they're challenging. And it's not, obviously it's our allies that also need to challenge, but we also need to challenge. But we also need to be accepting of questions, as long as those questions are coming from the right place. The are, we, are we ready for that, Mark? Are we ready for the right yeah. questions? Are, are we ready as members yeah. of the LGBTQ? Are we ready for those questions? I, I, I welcome those questions. Okay. And if I see someone engaging with me and I'm talking to them with drinks and they're engaging with me and asking me about being a gay man, which mm. is what I have experience in, <laughs> uh, then I'm more than well, I'm willing to, to help them and educate them. Yeah. As long as they're coming from a good intent and not coming from a harmful position. The question could be completely wrong, but as long as the meaning behind it is the right meaning and they're willing to change. So, yeah, uh, and parts of our real estate business uh, across the sector, there's different parts that I need to work on more things. The ones that are um, have toxic masculinity uh, yeah. from the heterosexual community, those things need to be pushed and challenged and changed. Um, so it's just keep pushing really I Absolutely. think once you've got all those policies in place it's engagement and continually pushing and being visible yeah thank you um, just kind of like looking ahead and just thinking about your your response we know that um, straight uh, Gen Z employees are uh, attuned to organisational change um, in terms of culture and they will very soon make up the majority of our workforce. So Rico, as if you don't mind me referring to you as a member of Gen Z, <laughs> can you give us a glimpse uh, into the near future of what that working environment might look like, or feel like, or what you envision it to be? Oh, I'd love to. Let's just <laughs> hop in the time machine <laughs> briefly. Um, and yeah, let's hop forward to the future, I think. The first thing that immediately comes to mind is sort of genuine diversity and inclusion. I think sort of, I think Gen Z is, you know, the most sort of educated generation that there's been. And I think not only just sort of academic education, it's that kind of emotional intelligence, that kind mm -hmm. of like that. The, the, the empathy, I think, which is something that the generation of, of Gen Z seems to have a lot of. And I think when you're not, you, when you don't belong to sort of any minority group whatsoever and you don't have or you've not grown up with that childhood that association of people <laughs> from those minorities I think there's naturally going to be a disconnect it's hard to relate to someone if you know when your whole life wasn't these things didn't exist back then and stuff so I think going back to Gen Z I think that empathy I think even if it is you know a, a straight white guy um, I don't think that he would necessarily have to walk in the other person's shoes to understand that the journey that they're on. Yeah. Um, and I think sort of playing off that also is mental health. I think that that will be taken a lot more seriously. And I'd go as far to say as respected, I think in light of you know the, the pandemic and the movements that we're making now, we're definitely going in the right direction. And I think Gen Z will sort of bring in new initiatives to sort of like, a, in, you know, maybe incentive incentives to have self-care day, because I feel as society stands now, it's very reactive. It's like, oh, you, you've got burnout, what can we do to help? I think the, the approach that I anticipate my generation hopefully taking is the, it's, it's the proactive approach. It's the recognizing, again, referring to the empathy that I think my generation has a lot of and, and seeing where people are at and being able to put things in place and you know, discretionary days off for mental health and just, you know, if, you, if you're feeling the type of way, open up about it and I think, that it's going to be that those parts as well will play into things like sustainability and making the the world a better place for for everyone. I like that. 
But equally, I'm not Gen Z and uh, I've got my views. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's really, I think, you know, your, your opinion is really important because you are effectively going to change the shape of, of the workplace, of, of the world as a whole. And I think every generation which comes through, they think they're going to be the ones who are going to, I suppose change is just continuous, isn't it? It's just, it's, it's, it's progressive. Um, so no pressure. We look forward to, uh, <laughs> to that beautiful uh, moment in time. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch upon, um, well, if I asked Joe this question, we had a little bit of a catch up. And um, one of the things through re reviewing this issue is the fact that I recognise that trans and non-binary uh, people within the workforce um, are sometimes a bit silent um, in the wider LGBTQI uh, conversation. And I just wanted to give voice um, in this space to that and A, say I recognise that. Um, but how do we create an environment which is truly inclusive? Because even within the LGBT community, there are still um, issues of intersectionality or matters of intersectionality and some people are still excluded so from your experience joe uh, where do we fall down and, and how do we fix it um, right so that's a big question it is a big, <laughs> um, big question excuse me um i think the first the most important step is to recognize that um that there is an issue um because then we we're part way along the road to fixing it. Um, so I'd say number one is to recognise that we exist um, and that we are underrepresented. Um, and next is to invite us, invite trans and non-binary people to, to sit at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, so invite us to the events uh, and give us an opportunity to speak and, and share our experiences. Um, and that's, I think, in, in, intrinsic within that comes a recognition of the different strands of uh, the trans and non-binary experiences. Uh, so I can, only, I can only speak for my white experience. Um, I can't speak for, for people of colour um, who are non-binary or trans, uh, but I can empathise with them and, uh, and I can act as, with them as an ally to, to um, amplify, and amplify their voices and enable them to be visible. Um, so I think the next one is to. Um, <clears throat> are you trying to are you trying to take my question away from me, Joe? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> you go ahead now. Sorry. My next question. I could to talk you. all day. <laughs> my next question to you is something you, you just touched upon, and that is um, the white your white privilege. Um, and it was so beautiful, kind of having these exchanges with you to kind of discuss this, because sometimes it's really difficult to be in a space to discuss. Uh, issues in the L L within the LGBT community, but then we lose the fact that actually there are a whole bunch of other layers. So, you know, you, 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 you've you um, uh, said to me that you've come from a particular background in a certain part of, of the UK. And so you have full access to different cultural experiences and different people of colour, different races. Um, how do you use your white privilege as a trans woman to give voice to people who are also trans and non-binary, but do not look like you in terms of colour? Um, right, I think uh, I wrote down some notes on this. Um, I think first of, first of all is when I share my experiences is to make it clear that it's, it's a white experience uh, and that we need to look at all the different strands. Uh, so, um, hopefully, I'll just try and advocate and uh, for for all the people, yeah. for all of us, yeah. basically at the table, um, because some of us aren't, and, and we need to be. Um, and I think it, within that, I'd, I'd ask myself, why don't uh, there are people of colour who are trans and or, or non-binary people in the profession? Um, so the question I'm asking myself is, why aren't they at the table? And is it because that they don't feel it's a safe space? Mm -hmm. um, so um, if we can't elevate their experiences because 
we don't know at this stage uh, about those experiences because the, the people are not at the table. Um, then I would use um, examples from other professions. Yeah. Um, that's where I, when I came out, I was looking for role, visible role models. I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't see any, any in the RICS or in the wider profession. So I looked to other professions where, um, and it happened to be the Ministry of Defence. I thought if, if a person could transition in the, in the MOD <laughs> in a fighting role, then that must be probably the hardest situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd, look, I'd look around at, at different professions and, and share those experiences um, and give, give those people room to enable them to have a place at the table and, and room to speak. Uh, and, and just, uh, is it fair to kind of assume that even uh, within those white spaces, if I may use that term, yeah. that just even being in that space, it's, it's still, you can still use your privilege in that space to amplify the voice of others. So I think it's, you know, you're, you're positioned in, quite uniquely to actually bring other people with, with you. So I, yeah. you know, um, kudos. I, uh, I, I, I'm from Leicester. So I'm used to being in a space where um, there are lots of different people. It's a real Leicester. I love Leicester because it's a real melting pot of different uh, mm. cultures and um, religions, um, different traditions, and, and that's that's what I've grown up with, and that's what I love. Um, so that's that's the that's the profession that I want to see. Yeah. Uh, when I don't see that, I feel it makes me feel really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, thank you. I think um, at the end of the day, you know, we, uh, we we need allies to advocate for us, but we also need to advocate for other people within within our community. Um, my last question, because I think it's um, it's probably time for me to wrap up soon. We'll go to Mr. Mark Burnett. <laughs> Um, how do you specifically use your social power at work uh, to elevate LGBTQI voices? Um, my role um, within the industry is on the operational side. Mm -hmm. So it is there is not because it's based mainly a sort of a male orientated industry and it's all male biased. Yeah. It's very rare for anybody to actually come out as LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. to me in person on site. I don't know why, but I, um, I, even though I've got the pride flags up on my desk of, on the sites site I'm on. The, um, what I do do is, and I have done it on a number of occasions, is that um, we as part of Building Equality have got a toolbox talk on allies on ally, allyship. And I've delivered that on a number of occasions to the site team, so to the guys on site. And it has been very well received. They've been, things like they've been amazed about the amount of different flags there are, for example. So it's, and they've actually all said that they've learned something. Yeah. Um, to me, I've also, um, to me, this whole, yeah, this whole subject is quite personal okay. because um, my daughter came out to my wife and I two years ago as being gay. And then a year ago, she uh, then came out and told us that she was now going to identify, she now identifies as a male. And um, both my wife and I are, are quite involved in LGBTQ plus um, networks through our, through our work. Right. And um, also sort of women's networks and that sort of thing, we're also involved with those as well. So it's, um, she told us and we basically, we accepted, we accepted it straight away. Uh, we've given her our hundred percent support, mm -hmm. and also telling the wider family as well was a surprise because um, we didn't. We thought we'd have a few problems within within the family, but everyone within our family is has been basically an ally to him. So now he identifies as Nathaniel, no longer Amy, it's Nathaniel, and um, both my wife and I couldn't have been proud of her, as I said um, when she when he told us told us this. And to me, that is an example of what we could do in the workplace. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And it's, uh, we're not always going to have a member of our, of, of our family 
but I think as human beings, we all connect just 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 on a on, on a very basic level. But obviously, f for yourself, it has a more personal driver and. Um, I just wish there were a few more parents across the land who, who were as uh, well, basically, advanced. Basically, as we said to as we said to Nathaniel, we as a as we're three, we're sort of impenetrable. We're yeah. very, very close, and we're going to go on the journey together. Absolutely, I like it that. may it may take a long, it may take many years, but we're going to go go on the journey together, and yeah. we'll get get there. So he's in a better place, and he can identify as his real so, his real person. Yeah. That's, that's some serious support. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think I'm probably out of time. Um, I don't know if there's any um, opportunity for a Q&A. Probably I'll be doing. Um, I'd like to open uh, <coughs> floor, see if there's anybody who, oh, there is uh, somebody on the right hand side. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the um, sort of allyship, and Joe, you mentioned the story about Leslie, which is, you know, fantastic. How do we encourage people to to do that and call out microaggressions, which are maybe not as obvious as, as that one which occurred against you without your knowledge, um, in a way that is impactful, but also not militant and making everyone else feel uncomfortable that they can't say anything? You know, I, I, I'm, that's something I'm struggling with it in my own workplace about how to make sure people are saying, well, you know what, hold on, that's inappropriate, but not doing that every five minutes. You know, where's the line? How, and how do we encourage people to do that comfortably? Mm. Anyone like to answer that question? Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks. That was a good question. Um, I think, Mark, you, um, both Marks, you, you um, sort of touched on this. And uh, I think first I'd ask myself, why would I not want to be an ally? Um, I'd want people to advocate. If I was a cis man in a in a workplace, I'd want people to advocate on my behalf if I wasn't in a room and um, and something inappropriate was said about me. Um, and that's all. We're we're just asking for for people to do that and to. Um, Give people who face oppression uh, in whatever form it is um, to 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 elevate their those voices and mm. give us a um, allow us a uh, a place at the table to be heard. Um, I mean, it is basic human rights as well, isn't it? Really, yeah. That's that's essentially what we're what we're speaking what we're speaking about. Thank you, Joe. Any other questions? I've got something to add to that. Oh, go, go for it, Mark. Um, so I work in the commercial market, so there's transactional, lots of transactional people around, and in times it can be quite to masculine, toxic masculinity, I've referred to it before. And you do get elements of banter, which they, which um, most people in the industry use as a bonding mechanism. And sometimes you are, you, you hear comments about uh, being a gay guy, being part of a Pride UK network. Um, What's the? How do you become a member? Uh, what's the initiation? Wow. So you can see where these conversations are going. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in that moment, you've got a decision whether to say, okay, well, that's not appropriate. This, that's how. This is what. This is what it's making me feel like. But if I'm not there in the room, I would. I would like to think my colleagues, who are um, accepting and, and absolutely amazing, that they would say something in my place. Mm -hmm. They would say, well, if Mark was here, how would he feel? If you said that. Um, I think there's a, there's a fine line between between the banter-friendly relationship building and then the really inappropriate uh, language that might appear. And, and I hope what Rico said, like Generation Z coming through, um, and hopefully they will be able to take over and it will be all great. However, what you've got is if you've got innate teams which do have that toxic masculinity and you've got these young um, starters joining their teams, unfortunately, there is an element of herding an element of doing as your boss does or your team does. And you see it in, in sports, you see it in football, you see it in rugby. Um, so it's about trying, let's, let's, we just need to educate, push, be visible and do it in a friendly manner. And it's, for me, it's all about intent. And um, yes. if they're open to understanding where you're coming from, then hopefully they change. Thank you, thanks. I think there was one other question 
Thank you. I have actually a, a question from one of our online participants for Mark Bennett. Uh, Mark, you talked about coming out as an ally. Did you use that expression because you think or know potential allies face similar fears to LGBTQ people? I think um, if I take you back to the first time that I decided to take part in Pride, it was something that I was um, very sort of nervous about actually um, what people would think. But then I thought, well, what the hell, just go for it. And thoroughly enjoyed the thoroughly enjoyed the day, and I've done about three or four prides since. So it's um, but coming out as an ally um, was probably the wrong 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 wording. Okay, so it was, that was probably a mistake on my part. But being an ally is to me is being, is important to everyone, be it on the to the LGBTQ plus community. I'm also an ally on the gender diversity as well, so I do on, on both sides as well, all across the board, basically. Thank you. All right, I believe that concludes our q and I want to thank everybody for listening in, both in person and online. Uh, apologies, Sybil, if I've run over. Um, it's such a huge subject um, that um, we can all kind of uh, speak to, um, you know, for quite a while it's a progressive uh, matter and i think you know next year this time we'll probably be giving updates on this um on, on this very uh, matter of visible um, lgbtq role models within our respective consultancies and workplaces i want to thank everybody for your time and your patience and for listening in and uh, please could you give a round of applause for my panel members <laughs>
a little bit better. So of, of the people that took part in, in the survey, 78% of them uh, identified as L LGBTQI. Um, we had some allies taking part as well, which is always uh, welcomed. 53.4% uh, of those uh, identified as gay, 15.5% uh, as lesbian, 7.7% as bisexual, and just 2.3% as trans. And we'll come back to some of those figures in a, in a moment. Um, some of the other stats I want to pull out um, to you are, we had a really depressing number in 2021 um, of the number of people that were comfortable coming out at work. That had slipped back to a new low um, over the last three years that we've been doing this to 64.3%. I'm happy to say that when we did this survey again, that had um, nudged up quite significantly to 77.7%. Uh, some of the other um, important um, issues and touching on um, sort of our conversation about visible role models uh, was um, that we saw the highest number of, of respondents saying that they thought there were visible role models in this wonderful industry of, of ours. It's still not brilliant, but it was the highest number. So 62.2% of our respondents um, said that they thought there were um, enough visible role models in, in the business. Um, however, 73% um, of respondents said that if we had more, it would be even better. Um, so, so there's a lot to work on there. And a huge number of our respondents, the, the highest proportion um, yet, 80% um, wanted to see more action from the sector um, uh, on promoting in inclusion. So there's a lot of work there to do. Um, some other positive figures to come out of that. So there was a huge amount of, it felt like there was a huge amount of support for our LGBTQ uh, employees. Um, so 78.7% of our survey respondents thought that they were supported by uh, managers and, and senior managers. Um, obviously that should be 100, but um, uh, we, uh, it's, a, it's a decent number for now. And encouraging for, for me was that 71% of our respondents would recommend real estate as a safe and welcoming and inclusive place to work, which is a number that we can improve, but is a number um, not to be ashamed of. Um, so there are just a few um, figures there to throw around. And, and, I, and I talk through those because those numbers do help us, as I said earlier, then uh, progress and move this industry forward. And we'll get to why that data collection is so important and, and actually some of the barriers that there might be to that um, very shortly. But uh, I've gabbed on enough and I'm going to throw um, to my panel just to give their little introductions and throw us that one stat that they, their favourite stat out to the audience and why that's import, important. I'm going to start closest to me with Gaynor. My favourite stat is... Introduce yourself first, Gaynor, Sorry. come on. <laughs> Gaynor Warren Wright, uh, practicing on my own, arbitrator and uh, trans female. Uh, my favourite stat out of all of those was the 2.3% uh, trans representation in the community. Firstly, that's a far bigger fact, a far bigger percentage than is recognised by the government. And secondly, that probably 2% is represented by people here. So I think it is actually a distorted figure. I think there is more. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Carrie Matheson. I'm Head of Capability and Culture at RICS. Um, my favourite percentage, um, and it's a little bit more arbitrary, hmm. is 14.26%. Ooh. Am I supposed to explain that now? Yes, please. Okay. Otherwise, we're all it's in gonna leave it, I thought we were going to leave that hanging. That's actually the percentage of employees in RICS who are prepared to identify themselves versus the 100% of employees who are prepared to explain their gender. So the great news is, Sib, we've got a way to go. That's very interesting. And I was going to throw, because we've got this lovely list of names behind yeah. us of presidents. Wouldn't it be amazing if one, one day in the future... There was some identification on here as well. You know, it's pride 
It's Pride Month. Let's be proud of who we are as individuals. I would love to see that. Can we make it happen? Mark. Hi, everyone, um, and, and thanks for inviting me along today. My name is Mark Harrison. I'm the head of equality, diversity, and inclusion transformation at the CIOB. And um, my favorite stat, it's, it's, it's a number rather than a percentage. And that is that um, 60 companies this week have signed up to the CIOB's um, EDI charter <clears throat> that we launched in November. So we're seeing uh, some enthusiasm in the sector, which I think is really encouraging. Congratulations. Andrea. Um, I'm Andrea Selfall. I'm a senior data analyst within OACS. I've uh, been at OACS for just under six months, but I've worked in data for almost 10 years now. Um, my favourite statistic had to be asked at a survey um, regarding the amount of people who felt supported by their line managers to be yeah. open in, the, in employment, um, just because it means you feel able to be your whole self at work um, and be completely open at who you are and be your true self. self, true self. Fantastic. And let, let's stick with those numbers then and why it's important. You know, we can, all of us can spout um, stats um, and, and talk, talk to them, but why is it important that we are collecting this data and, and what are the best means for us, us to do it? And I wonder, Andrew, if you can start with that question. I think it's so important to collect this data so we can really understand the barriers and the issues we're having within the sector, so we can understand who our sector is made up of and what we can do to kind of be, help the sector become more inclusive. It helps us drive forward initiatives that we can, so we can include everyone moving forward. Thanks. Mark? Yeah, absolutely. You back up what Andrea is saying. I think we, we need to um, start with data. Uh, we need to be empirical. We need to, in order to understand where uh, underrepresentation is, uh, without it, we're just guessing. We're making assumptions and that, does, that doesn't work. So it's absolutely critical for that. I'd also say um, it's also critical for understanding the impact on actions we adopt to promote diversity and inclusion and equity. Without data, how will we know what's working? How much, more, how much further you know, work is needed? So critical in those two things. And I should just mention, um, just in passing, as it were, a little plug. The, uh, I think Chris mentioned it earlier on in the, uh, in the intro. Um, I'm part of the group, as is Sybil, of course, um, of the EDI representatives from six membership organisations, sorry, professional membership organisations, who signed uh, the, the MOU in April, or rather the CEO signed it, which was great. Um, the second, well, there's, there's three actions. The first action we've, we've agreed to work on um, is to produce some consistent, robust data across all of the protected characteristics in, uh, uh, within the built environment so that we have, we don't currently have it, we need that, we need that information to, to understand uh, where we need to focus our attention and, and again, how uh, effective progress is uh, on the actions that we adopt. So I would say absolutely critical that we have the data. So we know why how how do we how do we do it? And uh, again, I'm going to turn to you here because we talked about that 2.3 percent trans. You you're saying that ain't true. Um, how do we how do we make sure that when we collect this service? It, so um, uh, open book for me here. The number of respondents that we've had to the survey over the years is going down. Um, I don't know if that's survey <coughs> fatigue or if it's just because oh you know I've done that once I don't I don't want to do it again. How do we make sure? that people feel comfortable, willing, and re really want to share their data, tell their story, so that we can, can make a change? I think it comes back to um, visibility of role models. Now, I know the stats said that, uh, I can't remember what it was, we've got 50 52.2% said there were enough. Well. There are, there's only one role model that I'm aware of on the trans side, and that's Antonia Belcher, and she's just retired. Um, I don't think that there are sufficient trans and non-binary role models available to uh, effectively assist and help bringing people out comfortably into their work environment. And why do you think that is? 
Why? Well, discrimination, fear. <laughs> um, for me, it was acceptance. Um, uh, it was the walking into the unknown. What was going to happen to my income? How were my family going? How is my family going to react? Um, where does my family security go? It's a it's a huge, a huge, a, a huge cauldron of fears. Um, and I suppose if I plug my my particular line, that once that fear is removed as I found with myself, that you have a completely different mindset that's free of that tension and free of that um, personal fear that enables you to move on and enjoy life. But why are there no role models? There aren't enough of us that are out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And, and fear, is, fear is a big, a big issue, isn't it? it fear it, is huge. It was one of one of the most upsetting um, pieces of insight that I got from the data this year was that uh, usually the number one reason why people wouldn't come out in the workplace was, oh, there's not enough role models. This, this year, that wasn't the case. There are enough role models. Now, the number one reason was, I don't know how my colleagues and clients are going to react, and I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that, which to me is a huge step backwards. So, Andrea, how do we create... The, the culture, I suppose, that gets rid of that fear, you know, enables people to understand that, that everyone in the room is accepting of us as individuals. It's interesting. Um, so Chris, in his introduction, said it's about action. And I think I'd have to be honest, I'm of an age to remember when we brought targets in around gender for the backlash <laughs> and the negativity around that. So I say this with some caution, but I think it, it, there's, there's three prongs for me, which is we need to, to be active and think about targets. And I say that with caution because of the, the historical tape playing in my head. But this is about targets in terms of sourcing. So going back before the employment. So going through how can we start putting in place targets to put money into development, to source in the right places, Mary Louise, to um, think about our brand and our employer identity. And this is the case for all organisations. So I think that's the first one. On its own, targets will be um, negative, but I think it's a topic we need to start leaning into actively. Second thing for me is, um, <laughs> it's about the environment. So doing things differently. We, in, the first group talked about a little bit about passive and there's something about if we continue to do what we've done, we'll get more of the same. So when I see organisations, I don't see overt negativity. You talked about sort of microaggression or discrimination, but there's also just a passivity in terms of I'm with you, but I'm not going to do anything. So there's something for me about as an organisation our employees and us as individuals should take accountability for learning. You talked, Mark, about ask me the question, even if it's the wrong question. So it's for all of us to take some accountability about learning and understanding. And I love the phrase ally. I think, you know, let's, let's give that a label so that we all start having this conversation. And then the third thing for me is about doing stuff differently. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, we talk about sort of unconscious bias training. I've been in the industry long enough to know I've never come across one of those training sessions that's actually any good. And if anybody's got, you know, and has a positive impact, I know we have to do it. But let's look at doing things differently. So one of the things at RSCS that we're doing is we're doing skill bites and we're doing them on different subjects like trust, like I've got your back, how to build psychological safety. And I think there's lots of little activities. They're all part of a larger pan that we need to join up. And, and, and I think there's something around that that we need to move forward on. But you mentioned um, one of the questions in the first group was about um, you holding people accountable and you said without doing it again and again so that, that people get bored with it or a bit irritated. But if the conversations are happening and again and again and again, part of me wants to say, maybe we do need to step in as organisations go, that's not okay. You know, it has to go past the come on, and holding people accountable. If we see patterns, we need to be brave. 
and we need to step in and deal with stuff and be seen to. And that's where the, the data is so yeah. vital, isn't it? And data isn't just numbers on a, on a page, it's those patterns, yeah. patterns that we see. And there's a, there's a role there, isn't there, for companies who do collect that data, who do share it, who do understand what's going on in their business to be exemplars, I, I su suppose. And, uh, and Gaynor, I know you've got a great story about EA, EA Shaw and you, when you were there, how you made a purposeful decision <coughs> To be like, well, we're going to we're going to improve our data by being very open and 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 welcoming. We we did, um, and we found ourselves with a relatively large uh, contingent of the gay and lesbian community in EA Shaw, and effectively went out and actively recruited from that sector, because we found that we got staff or employees who were above, shall we say, the pay grade of a medium-sized firm wanted to come and join us. But in the early, early two, I don't 2002, so mid-2000s, um, you were still in that sort of paradox of how far do you go? Well, I remember one partners meeting where we did have a major paradox uh, when the head of residential very skillful lady, wanted to just take comfort from the fact that she wanted to employ somebody from the gay sector. But the paradox was, A, he was Australian, B, he was extremely camp. And everybody just said, yes, fine. And we found that when he left, the whole residential community in and around Covent Garden Midtown actually saw him as a loss. So his contribution, both to the firm and to society, was absolutely invaluable. Thank you. Andrea, for, for you, this role in, in data changing an environment, how, how important is that for you? And what are some of the things that we can do to in, encourage more participation? I think it's all about building that culture and that trust and that confidence in an organisation and how they're going to use that data. I think organisations need to be very clear um, about the purpose of the data they're collecting, what they're going to use it for, and what it's going to help drive forward. I think quite often you see in EDI form it's a tick box exercise, so that just should be there because, it, because everyone else has it there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you give people a reason to fill it in, a reason to kind of share their data, um, they're more likely to, to be able to, to do that. And, and what are some of the things that we should be learning from the data and putting it putting into action? For me, one of the things, um, and I know Kelly's in the audience, we've, we've talked a bit about, about this before, but one of the things that I see through the data that we collect is, you know, real estate's doing a pretty good job of being inclusive for gay men. What, it, the, what the data doesn't show me that it's being pretty, pretty, doing a pretty good job of being inclusive for the trans community. It's doing a pretty shit job of that. Excuse my language. Um, it's not doing a very good job for the lesbian community and it's not doing a very good job for the for bisexual community. So how should, how should we, how should I, I'm asking for some tips on journalism, how, how should I be using that data to help encourage better actions from, from this industry? And maybe Mark, you can answer that question. Well, forgive me, I'm not, I'm not used to advising journalists. I never take it, but the I can try. <laughs> I think, I mean, as I said before, data is essential. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of um, very um, well-meaning activities that we see happening and have done over the decades that have got precisely nowhere um, because it's not based on data. So I think it is, it is really, really important that we recognise that, um, you know, having robust empirical data will reveal where problems lie and where those barriers are. I mean, I, I've used it in different uh, sectors and on, on different characteristics. And I've, one, um, one that springs to mind is where we had, um, we did a, a equality analysis and used data on the question of employing disabled people within a, a housing association. And we used the data by examining the data at different stages of recruitment. And this is equally applicable to any uh, protected characteristic, including LGBT+, of course. 
um, what we were able to do was identify that, in fact, if we looked at the uh, numbers of people who uh, applied for roles compared to people who were shortlisted and then appointed, what were we, we were able to identify the leak in the pipeline, as it were. As it turned out, the, applic the applications were not representative of what we know as the disabled community in the, in the employment sector. So we were able to say, right, it's our reputation. As an organisation, as an employer, we want to employ the best people. Uh, so we need to develop a reputation as being disability friendly. So we changed, we did some marketing comms work. We set up uh, a disability staff group. They advised us and we were able to take actions to change the reputation, change the culture of the organisation. So it was, it, you know, data can be really, really helpful. And we, we have limited resources, let's, you know, let's be honest. Um, so we need to target that, those resources with you know, business intelligence, I guess. Thank you, thank you. Carrie, same question to, to you, just looking for my advice. <laughs> um, I think if you can show cause and effect, um, so, you know, nothing's gonna turn anybody off more than, you know, I contributed and there was no so what coming out of it. So I think it has to be a clear relationship between, you know, cause you said, we did effect. And I think it's as, that, as simple as that. And I think it's the, the message management and it's the, um, and probably the personal stories. Mm -hmm. um, so making it very real, because again, this is something that we can all admire as a problem out there and, and not have a relationship with it. So I'd probably say, so internally we, we, we talk about dare to share, um, where people are sharing their stories and making it real. I think that would probably engage people and re-engage. Dare to share, I like, I like that a lot. But, and, and linked to that, so I guess is, is the questions we ask to gather that, that data and the, and the right kind of data that we want, it's probably going to cause us or cause some, some of us to have to ask <laughs> questions that we feel uncom uncomfortable asking. How, how do we go about that? Do we just need to lose the, fit, lose the fear and ask any question and, and, hope, and hope that we're okay? How, how, do we, how do we do that? Again, I'm, I'm going to come to you because I know you, you will, one, ask any question, you'll answer any question. <laughs> I've had to answer every question. <laughs> <laughs> and some of, them, <clears throat> some of them are very personal, but I haven't, sh I haven't declined to answer any question about my transition. Um, I think it, it, it promotes openness, it takes away fear, and that's taking away fear not just from the, the trans community, but fear from the rest of the community who are fearful. Somebody mentioned toilets earlier, earlier on. Well, for goodness sake, using the ladies' loo is far more discreet than using a gent's loo because you're all cubicles. So what does it matter? Um, what's the question? How do we ask difficult questions? How do, how do, we, how do we ask? To collect, to how collect do we the data ask? we need. Well, what I've learned is that, that when I'm in front of an audience, I've, I've basically said, look, I'm open to any question you want. Um, and I think you'll find that most trans people are open to those questions. And, but don't, don't deploy a derogatory type of approach. Um, deploy something that is in, that, you know, demonstrating your genuine interest in finding out why, what, what have you been through? What was it like whilst you were in hiding? And, I think that there is genuine interest out there. So I, I have to say, it's just don't, don't be afraid of asking. Just think about how you phrase that question. And make sure that you say, I'm asking you this because yeah. this is what I want yeah. to learn. This is how I want to make, hopefully make this world a better, better place. Gain more understanding and then as a consequence, make, make the world a better place. Yes. Yeah. Mark, you were nodding there. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a really interesting <coughs> question. The question of questions is, is interesting. Maybe I'm a bit nerdy. But um, 
what's interesting, and, and this this is something that, as I've said, we're thinking about working with other, those other professional membership organisations. Language and terminology is contentious. We have to be very sensitive to that. Um, but the, I suppose, you know, it's, I, I, I would repeat or echo what Andrea said, which is, you know, we need to show people what the data is going to be used for. Uh, it's there for everyone. It's for the benefit of everybody. It's not just you know, underrepresented groups. It's there for the whole, uh, the whole workforce. Um, and I would say, yeah, you've got to you've got to talk about confidentiality. And I would say, uh, echoing other comments that have been made, ask the question as few times as often. Uh, you know, if you can, don't don't repeat the question. Collect the data once if you can. There needs to be an opportunity to refresh the data. And I'm I'm talking here about quantitative data not qualitative um, obviously um, but um, you know most most protected characteristics can change so people need that opportunity but um, and you know is the prefer not to say option which and I've I've been doing this job some some years now and um, it's interesting what's changed so in the in the 80s people of my generation I'm not generation Z as you might have noticed um, that people we started asking questions around race and ethnicity and people were quite angry about that um, and this was I was working in a local authority at the time and people objected strongly to this question uh, now we see that question and on the whole people don't object to it uh, and I, I, I work for a housing association um, <clears throat> that got up to we got up to fifth place in the Stonewall Index in 2012 um, and I had conversations with Stonewall at the time and, and they were saying, well, you know, we were discussing, should there ever be a prefer not to say option? And in, in the future, you know, we should be aiming for a position where there is no prefer not to, to say, but we're not there yet. So you'll see on the forms, uh, no doubt that, that employers use, you'll have that in particular reference to sexual orientation, religion or belief, for example. And, and, and gender identity, but you know that's I think that's an ongoing and interesting question about data. But I'm, I mean I, I've got lots of anecdotes that I could regale. But uh, one that springs to mind is that a housing association, and that was in the Thames Valley some some years ago, sent out their first uh, tenants sort of survey, as it were, and asked the sexual orientation question for the first time. And somewhat inevitably, one of the local newspapers had the, the front page of this tenant, angry tenant, waving a document on the front page. Why are they asking about my, you know, my sexual orientation? And, um, you know, a bit of a furore. But um, what the, the housing association in question found was that next week they got lots and lots of questionnaires coming in from tenants who realised the value, despite the, 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 the negative publicity, people got it. And, and sort of sending it in. So um, I would say, in some senses, uh, you know, any publicity is good publicity in that respect. Andrea, any, any thoughts on... I saw you nodding along to Mark there. Yeah, it was quite interesting. So I remember back in, like, the early 90s, coming home from school with an EBI form for my parents to fill in and then being absolutely furious that they had to fill this form in because they didn't know what the purpose of it was, you know, as far as they were concerned. You're asking about the ethnicity of my mixed race child. What are you going to do with that information? Mm -hmm. Are you going to hold it against her later on? And as a child, I never really realised the kind of position on it. I was a bit kind of like, well, why are my parents causing a fuss over this? It's just a form. I'll fill it in myself. And it wasn't until I became a parent myself and I had to fill in that form for my child. And I had to kind of tick the box, you know, what's my sexual orientation? And that momentary kind of feeling of, actually, if I take down the lesbian, What's the impact on my child? What's the school going to do? How are they going to treat him differently? So I can understand people's fear around sharing that data and not wanting to kind of put themselves out there. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it, the language that we're, that we're using. Um, how are they going to use that against me rather than how are they going to use that for, for me, which I guess is the point that we need to get to in this, in this whole debate, this whole movement, that we change that language, that it's, it's not, oh, they're going to use this to classify me, to, um, you know, sort of work against me, to tick a box. They're going to do it because actually positive cha changes is coming. Um, Carrie, I know you were, you were about to jump in, I think, and I talked over you. Um, no, it was literally, I was just thinking, so I'm not a data geek. Um, you know, my interest in data is really small. 
my interest in the insight that comes out of it is 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 endless and i think it's your point about you know um, for positive change it's back to that thing about cause and effect excellent excellent how are we doing on time mm -hmm. good are there any questions i'm going to um before i steal everything i'm going to open the floor up to some some questions and i i think there might be some on slido as well but anyone raise a hand don't be shy we're all friends here if not i will keep going i can go on for a long time no? None? Any from Slido? I can't quite see the board. All silent? What's that all about? Um, OK. <laughs> ah, hello. I, I'm not quite sure how relevant it is, but um, your, Mark, your comments about the prefer not to say, and I'm curious about why you say it's important to get to the point of not having that as an option. And the context in which I'm asking is, I was, uh, I recently started the, the ERG at in my workplace and I sent out the company-wide email to a thousand people and I was very clear about making sure they knew that HR was not going to be told if they were responding to me that they want to be part of the ERG and that this is um, confidential information and all that. And I thought, am I making this seem, am I making it a bigger issue than it needs to be, the fact that I'm actually saying this stuff and should I just be silent on it and, I, and I'm not sure what the right answer is. But so that I'm just kind of curious about your, why you say we need to get to the point of just not having that option. Um, I, just to be clear, I don't, I don't think um, we're not there yet by any means. Um, what I guess my point is that there needs to be, a, at some point in the future, people should, everyone should feel free to share uh, that information as with other protected characteristics without fear of discrimination, without fear that, they, that it will you know, do them harm. Uh, you know, that's, I guess that's where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely acknowledge that we're, we're not at that, that, that yet. We're not there yet. But events like this and the continued conversation and you know strat strategies to get there will have their impact, and hopefully over time that will change. Um, so yeah, for the time being, you know, we've just implemented at the CIOB uh, employee questionnaire, and we we had a uh, prefer not to say option on pretty much all of the questions to my frustration, but you know, we, I have to accept reality. Uh, that's where we are. It'd be great if it was redundant. It's a bit like the dare to share, mm -hmm. you know, it's snappy and it's useful, but wouldn't it be great we're in a place where we don't actually need to dare to share, but actually we're proud to share. Yeah. Um, but that's where we are and, and that's progress. We try in this survey, we try and use, let me answer that mm -hmm. in, instead. It, doesn't, it hasn't worked as well as I'd hoped yet, but hopefully, you know, that's the, well, I, they, I can either say, I don't want to say, or, you know, whatever you want to put in that box. Okay. I think there are changing attitudes that are coming through. Certainly from my perspective, I, when I came out, I was fearful about the reaction from RICS, and yet I received an absolutely fantastic welcome as the first transgender um, arbitrator and independent expert on the panel. Your fear is your clients, your friends, your family. And I think the one big thing, the huge thing that I learned is that how you dress, how you represent yourself is not the key factor. From a client point of view, they still want your brain. It doesn't matter a jot how you present yourself. They're employing you for your brain. And it should be that slightly, that, that slight disconnect. It should be totally irrelevant as to how you express yourself from a sexual point of view. It, it's just wrong. But don't get, don't get me wrong about this. There is still severe prejudice, particularly to the trans community in the UK. I have not encountered it in any material way in the central London community. Far from it, I've been welcomed. Um, the only major casualties I had were my, my um, sister-in-law and family, and quite frankly, we just put that down to extreme, extreme religious beliefs, and in fact, so extreme that if you took 12 o'clock as normal, they were sitting at 12.59. Um, and I was never going to get through that, that barrier. So. London is great. The provincial cities, 
I think without direct, well, I, mean, I have had direct, but the provincial cities have still got quite a long way to go. And, and let's talk about that, because that is, that is really important in this data collection. We see it across real estate in everything that we do, that everything is very London, London cent central, and it tends to be, we tend to get more interaction with the, with the London market. If we are serious about collecting data across this entire industry, across the entire geography, and using it with purpose, how do we engage across the country, across the different different sectors, real estate's huge, isn't it? So many different parts parts of it. How do we how do we do that? What are the what are the tools that we need to arm ourselves with to, to get to that point? Anyone can answer that. I think I think <laughs> Yep, sure, I'll, I'll have a go. So um, CIAB, as you may know, we're an international membership organisation, 47,000 members around the globe. And um, I think to some... I mean, I appreciate the point you're making. We are in somewhat of a metropolitan bubble. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. But we do have legislation in the UK and in Ireland, actually, which is broadly similar um, in respect of, of equality. I think where it becomes even more challenging is that international piece of work, and we are thinking about that now. And one of the perhaps benefits of the, of the pandemic has been our ability to meet now with relative ease of people around the globe. I, I had a meeting, um, we were discussing what our objectives should be for 2030. So what our EDI objectives should be around the world. And I had a conversation with um, there was one guy in Cape Town. There was a there was a colleague in Kuala Lumpur. One in we got one member in Kathmandu, um, and one in Australia, I think. And uh, what was really interesting was ha having a discussion about what equity, equality, diversity, inclusion means around the globe, and very different perspectives. Uh, co the colleague, actually it was one in UAE as well, so the colleague in UAE basically said we can't talk about LGBTQ plus uh, equality here because I'll end up in prison and, and we don't want to get members in uh, trouble so we're not going to advocate that but what he did say was we, what, what our issue is that people, European consultants come over and get paid seven or eight times the rate of a local uh, and that's Grossly unfair. That's you know, uh, uh, you can see why. In South Africa, the the member there was saying what we really need. The big issue for us is getting kids out of the townships into employment in construction, so they can support their families out of poverty. So real, really, really um, basic poverty stuff. Um, and interestingly, another conversation I had with a member in, in Canada. Um, who basically, and I, I was having a, a discussion much like this and saying, um, you know, what perhaps we could swap ideas, have a, you know, in, engage, have a conversation uh, on, on the agenda. And they said to me, well, we don't really think anyone in the UK has got anything to offer us hmm. because you're so far behind, which was uh, made me sit up and think, actually. So I think that is, you know, that in the... Over the next decade, that's what we're going to be thinking about, certainly at CIOB, and I, I dare say with other membership organisations, we need to think globally about what this means. And it, that's a, a is really challenging, but B is really interesting. Karen? And the reality is the one thing that every organisation has in, in, in sort of the same as each other is basically we all want the top talent and talent pipelines are diminishing and we know that we all typically historically have been fishing in the same pond and those ponds are getting smaller and smaller. So there's a global issue here in terms of organizational performance and success, which is they want to get the best people they can for roles. And so, you know, when you talk about a compelling case for change, there you've got your compelling case, mm -hmm. which is how do I get the best pool available? And that is about the most diverse and the largest pool. And we came back, we were talking earlier about, you know, making it a great place for people to work and want to, to be able to, you know, represent, uh, you know, in front of clients, but also performance. And when you think about psychological safety, that's a huge impact on creativity and performance. Google have done loads of research on it. And the reality is 
getting the data to get the insight to take the action to improve an environment where people want to come and stay and be productive that impacts your bottom line it, it certainly does and actually we have a stat on, on on that very thing in that every every year when we ask you know do you think dni um has an impact on the bottom line it's always at least 98 percent of people say oh yeah i do, I do think it does it's no brain, um, but then you know, then we compare that with the other statistics and it's clear that oh, you might think it, but you ain't doing it. So it, it, we need to create, the, yeah, the data needs to lead to, to action. And I guess that brings us back to, to the previous panel that would have been the post panel, uh, had I not been late, uh, um, about, about role models and the, and the role of role models and vis visible role models, visible allies in making sure that we do something with that data, that we get everyone encouraged into giving it, giving it up because they feel comfortable with that. There's no fear. It's a, this is going to help this environment that we're in, not this is going to be used against me. So I'd love to hear from, from each of you, I guess the ask for everyone here in this room, everyone who's listening in and people that they should then go and talk to because actually... The people in this room and the people listening and probably already doing it is those that, that aren't here and aren't listening and we really need to, to get um, moving. What's your, what's your ask to them to make sure that we can move forward? Okay, now. I suppose my ask would be to be relaxed, um, ask questions and be totally and utterly inclusive. The one thing I would say, which is a slight tangent, is that there is a somehow a general assumption that being transgender is all about male to female, it isn't. It's about 50-50. And if anything, coming from, the, from my information from the clinics, it's female to male that is actually dominating the surgery at the moment. Um, so we haven't really touched upon that side of the transgender community. But I think openness, openness, being candid, and be willing to ask questions and be willing to answer questions. Linked to that, do you think that is something that we, when we talk about uh, in surveys like this and we ask the question, are you do you identify as transgender? Do we need to go deeper than that and ask I, male to female, female to yeah, male? I do, yeah. Okay, thank you. Carry. I suppose my ask would be, be curious. Each and every one of us are part of this conversation and that's the issue with all of inclusion and intersectionality, everything. So be curious and go and ask questions. You know, there is such a thing as the internet, which is amazing. We can, you know, use your networks. Just go find out, educate yourself and take accountability for that. Thank you, Mark. Um, I guess I, what I should be saying is um, encourage all your em employers to sign up to the uh, CIOB d and Charter. Um, it sets out a, a very good uh, free, it's a very good free tool for progress on this agenda. Um, I guess, but I also want to think that, say, just um, sort of listening to colleagues is that what strikes me is there's an awful lot of, um, currently there's, there seems to be a resurgence of anti-LGBTQ plus noise uh, campaigns, uh, at, on social media in particular, which I, I personally think is, is, is worrying. I don't want to be alarmist, but um, I guess what, what they ask would be is for people to post uh, positive message, supportive messages whenever they get the chance to sort of counteract that uh, at the moment. That, that would be my ask. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I guess my ask is twofold. I think it's for individuals, if you feel comfortable sharing your data, please do so we can learn more and kind of do more to help you. And also to organisations to kind of take a step back and look at yourselves, understand what you're doing or not doing. That's something people from not sharing the data with you. Fantastic. And important that it's not just individual companies collecting that data. It is we bring that all, all, to de all together across, across the industry. And as, and as much as we want people to sign up to your, your charter, we want, <laughs> we want a industry-wide charter that everyone is working on the same, on the same trajectory to, towards. 
Um, I think this has been a really fascinating conversation. I think it's so important. Oh, there's a question. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I have a question from our online listeners, and the question for the panel is, is the stigma around disclosing sexual orientation embedded in the sexual aspect of the term, as romantic and emotional attraction is not a first thought? Oh. <laughs> Great question. I think, I think that perhaps the question needs to be rephrased. Um, to be more focused upon gender. And I was very, very surprised how few, at a recent, recent presentation that I did, how few people understood that sexual orientation was only just part of your gender identity. And I think that, that gender identity probably ought to be the focus rather than the, I suppose, slightly provocative or slightly, yeah, slightly provocative bold question what's your sexual identity because that that's not really getting at the uh, core of the problem yeah before i came to the panel today i wanted to just check back at the office what are the terms we use because it hadn't occurred to me um because i don't remember filling out the form um and and it's a great question because there is something about that which is incredibly private and it, just the very word sexual. Um, and it's interesting, the We're phrase... a bit British, aren't we? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't talk about that. Yeah. Um, but there is something about I, how do you identify that is very clinical. So I, I do wonder. It's a great question. We don't have the answer to it, but it did make... You know, I went and had a check and of the phrases we use and they're really quite old-fashioned. Um, and I do wonder whether, you know, identify, because it is actually quite clinical, um, maybe something that might be more accessible. But it's a, it's a great question. And it's an I, impossible question yeah. to answer. I don't think you can get away from the word identify, mm -hmm. but I think you can get away from being absolutely binary about it and go towards mm -hmm. asking your gen gender identity, your gender persuasion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any more questions from our online crew or in the room? Joe. There's a, there's a mic coming for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask the panel, um, well, I'd like to put a word of sat if you like. Um, I think there are 73 countries in the, in the world where it's illegal, it's a, it's a criminal offence to be an LGBTQ plus person. Um, and in eight of those countries, it's a, it's a capital offence, uh, punishable by death. So my question really is, the, the RICS is a, it's a global organisation, mm -hmm. it's a global brand. Uh, are we prepared to have those difficult conversations to, to uncover um, and allow, allow visibility for our members in um, less open and, and less accepting countries? It's a cracking question. I was thinking back to that, that question, and I haven't got a direct answer, but I think it's a really important component of the Government Council's strategic steering group mm -hmm. to look at just those questions. It's a challenge that we faced over the last two or three years in bringing forward changes to our international rules on professional conduct, and how do you practically enforce and monitor in different jurisdictions where there are such different legal frameworks? I'm afraid there isn't a straightforward answer, but it's definitely one where the work of the thought leadership team working with the steering group has to grapple with. I'm going to be the irritating journalist here and say there is an easy answer, isn't there, which is just don't allow them to be members of the RICS. Oh, she's gone rogue. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But, but what we're describing are the rights of individual members within those jurisdictions and their ability to practice and RICS having a, a role to perhaps support those members in those different jurisdictions, it is a really important question for us. It's not, it's not a, a binary question of RICS saying we cannot operate in that jurisdiction where we have members identifying in different ways, wanting to work in those communities in those different jurisdictions. So we've got to, to, 
to work through very carefully how we can support those members whilst retaining our commitment to the values of supporting the LGBT community. I'm going to go rogue one more time and then I promise I'll shut up. However, real estate has this amazing ability, right, to create places, people, places for people, safe communities. There is an argument, and I am being precocious here, I know, um, that people shouldn't be able to practice as surveyors and allow countries that allow this kind of horrific discrimination to prosper. And real estate enables countries to prosper. There's a, a, a this is the righteous McClary coming out. There is a responsibility on the industry to say, we won't support that. that that's for, you, your country needs to sort yourself out and you, you can't do it without us. So let's make the change. The governments have the same problem with Saudi Arabia if you report oh. in certain murders. They're still supporting them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not just the RICS. No, and my, my, my answer to that and my observation of that was this is an issue for all of the professions, not just charter surveyors. You, have, you can hold the lawyers to the same account. All areas where you have professional services operating across jurisdictions, it's, it's a huge issue. I completely agree. I absolutely agree. I also think we could leave. Uh, there was one more question. Sorry, and then I will shut up. Thanks. Uh, just very briefly on, on this subject, as many of you know, we run a global survey of the profession, um, and once a year it includes DEI questions, um, including on sexual orientation. We do get complaints, and it's not from the UK. It's from countries, mainly European, um, questioning the legality of how we can ask those questions. And we use uh, as a justification that they can opt to prefer not to say. Um, and that's how we, um, you know, uh, reassure them that what we're doing is legal and they do have an option to prefer not to say. Um, and that seems to satisfy their needs. But it, it is an issue and we do get complaints, but we need the data and we explain why we need the data. Absolutely. I think Sybil's going to throw me off stage now. So, uh, <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, um, I think that's been a really fascinating conversation. It's, it's clear that there's huge power in data, but we have to be responsible with the power that comes with that. Um, but please, everyone, put your hands together for our phenomenal panel. All right, that was another lively discussion. Um, I don't know about our viewers tuning in online, but here in the room, I think we could use a little bit of a break to stretch our legs. It's quite toasty. Um, so we're gonna give folks uh, a five minute break, um, and then we'll be back in to start panel three, the final panel for the day. So please be, please be back at five pass. All right, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed your quick break. Um, we're getting back started a little bit late, uh, but I really want to dive back into it so we have plenty of time for this third panel, uh, not just because I'm sitting on it, but I think there's more meaningful conversations <laughs> ahead. Uh, so with this one, I'm, I'm going to introduce Kelly. Many across the industry know her already. Um, I've been in this position as head of DEI for all of about seven weeks now, um, and I would say she's my first and biggest visible role model for me. Uh, operating in this space. Um, she's taken me under her wing and has opened, blasted open doors for me um, uh, across the spectrum of DEI already. Um, just a tremendous, tremendous support um, for all of the built environment, really. Um, but yeah, without further ado, Kelly Canterford, leading panel three, talking about how we get after advancing inclusion for LGBTQ plus professionals. Thank you very much. Afternoon, we're nearly there. It, it's, it's in touching distance now, so thank you very much for, for coming back and, and well, both online and here to, to listen to this final panel, which is, I think, really key to the message of today. How do we advance LGBT inclusion for professionals? Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Kelly Cantford. My pronouns are she and her. 
I am the program manager for Changing the Face of Property, which is a collaboration of 12 of the UK's largest real estate consultancies. Uh, I got into that role after being a surveyor at JLL. I was one of the founding members of the Building Pride Network there. Uh, and that's led me into different experiences. So I'm fortunate enough to have been made the co-chair of Freehold, and I am also the chair of the ULI's Ready Committee. Now, following on from the two brilliant panels earlier, we're, we're going to round off with that, what do we do now? Where do we go? And to help us find that path of where we take the industry and how we can support people, because we are going to be here. We're allies to everybody who are allies to us. So I'm going to turn to my left, and I'm going to start with introductions. Sure. I'll just very briefly just say my name and where I'm from so we can really get into the conversation. So I'm Michelle Bogues. I'm the R RTPI's EDI manager, and I've been in that post since November 2020. So uh, it's been fantastic so far and really great to be here. Thank you, Michelle. You've already heard plenty from me, so I'm going to go ahead and punt it right down the line. Uh, I'm James Brennan. I'm the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Manager at CBRE. And I've uh, been there under a year after having been working in a very much community-based organization. So it's been a very interesting first year to develop, jump into a brand new real, est real estate sector. I'm Sarah Draper. I'm Head of People and Culture at Ride Love It Bucknell. I've been with the business uh, just over two years. Thank you. A wealth of talent. And we're going to drill into that, that knowledge that we have on the, the panel. But before we, we look at the future, I think it's important for us to look at the foundations on which we're building on. Most LGBTQ people working in the built environment will be familiar with that split second moment, that decision of, do I come out now or not? It's, when I was starting my career back in 2000, I was out, I was proud, but there was still banter. And the banter came in all forms. Despite me being out as a, saying that I was in a same-sex relationship, it was a mixed race relationship, it didn't deter people from from saying things which were quite honestly unnecessary and hurtful. On top of that, I thought I was the only gay person there. So siloed was the industry, so quiet were the LGBT people were the industry. And it was because people feared that it was gonna have a detrimental impact on their career. And we look back at 2011 when Freehold was formed and we've got to thank, well, I have to thank David Mann and Sling Fazell for creating Freehold. That really was the change for the industry. And it's also important to recognise the risk it had to their careers. This could have been career ending for both of them because they were going into the unknown. But we moved forward 10 years and what a 10 years it's been. We've got LGBTQ networks throughout the built environment. We've got planning out, we've got building equality, open land, LGBTQ and FN to name but a few. 2017, we saw 12 of the UK's uh, CEOs from those large real estate companies participate in the first LGBTQ plus real estate conference. And then in 2018, the, the industry united against Brunei when they implemented the LGBT laws. And I know speaking to a number of people about the millions of pounds of fees that were lost by organizations because they would refuse to do business with the, the companies. It's fair to say things have got better, uh, as we've heard from Natalie's panel. We've got a lot more LGBTQ role models across the built environment, more than ever before. But with this, we're now seeing a demand for action. With the EG panel, we saw 80% of respondents said, this is brilliant, but we want to see more from the sector. We want to see promotion of inclusion by those leaders and we want more visibility about being anti-homophobic. -homoph the outcomes of the 2022 Bridge Group report saw um, them talk around the, the influence of the dominant culture in real estate, how people from minority backgrounds just didn't feel included. Change comes from making those people aware of how they make other people feel. Change comes from making people aware of their privilege. And let's remember, privilege is not a dirty word. It's just a point of making somebody aware of the doors that they have open and the path that is different to other people. 
the less barriers. And we really need to engage with those people to help drive that change forward. Have a look around the room. You know, we hear all people, it's like preaching to the choir. We want the change. We are keen to get that change to happen. <coughs> so my question really is how do we engage with people from that dominant culture? How do we engage with the people that really don't see the need for change? Because it's all right for me. How do we look at organisations and recognise that that feeling included is different for everyone? Feeling included is different for all of us on this panel. And with that, I'm going to open it up to the panel. So inclusion, we've got professional bodies here and we've got businesses represented. How does inclusion sit differently within professional for a professional body and for an organisation? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, start easy. <laughs> start easy, yeah. Uh, but I think there's probably a couple of key differences and then, and then Sybil can perhaps come in. But at, in an organisation, you tend to be thinking primarily just <coughs> about your employees and perhaps your clients and who you, and who you or, and or who you provide services for. Um, and so you may be thinking a lot of a lot of if you've been working in the EDI as long as I have, which is twenty plus years, you, you tend to it's a real kind of focus in organizations around what does it mean in an HR context and how do we comply with legislation and and so on. Um, all really important stuff. Um, but for a professional body we have to think about those things as professional bodies and who we employ. But we also have to think about well what does it mean for our members and where they work. So what is it? So um, we have 27,000 members, roughly, at RTP, and I forget how many RICS has. But we have to, th and they're all working in very different contexts, mm. different sizes, different public sector, private sector, and so on. We have to, so we have to try and understand what is our experience, what is the experience that our members have in all of these different spaces as employees. But also, what does it mean for our members who run their own business, who might be a private contractor, who might then be struggling to access certain types of contracts because maybe they're a black-led business or an LGBT business or whatever the case may be. So inclusion then starts to look not just about where you work, mm -hmm. but how you're able to manage and operate your business and the kind of contracts that you can you can kind of access. And then on top of that, just because, you know, why not have something else to think about? We also have to think about who's coming into the profession. Mm -hmm. So who's actually a who wants to be a surveyor or a planner or if we have Reba were here, an architect or and so on. So we have to think about all of those things and look at that complete journey from sort of start to finish. Who wants to be in this profession? Why do they maybe not want, why are they not maybe accessing the profession in the way that we sh they should? Um, what happens when they are in the profession? How are they experiencing that profession? Uh, and, and then, yeah, and, and then actually, you know, how are they, if they're operating a business, how does that work? So we have that a pretty big a really wide spectrum, but we have to be able to work then with the employers to think about well, actually, how can we support you in the in that little the pit, the bit that that works for you and where you're and what we're trying to do as well. If I can jump over to the employer <laughs> yeah. and then we'll yeah. come back. Yeah. All right. I think just where you're saying it's two different ways. So perhaps Sarah, if you take. Yes. Yeah. No, so, so I think from an employment perspective, and you touched on it there around the employment laws, but actually to be really inclusive, it's got to be authentic. Um, and I found it really alarming to hear that the main reason people um, weren't um, comfortable in um, saying their gender preference um, is fear, because actually that feels like we've gone massively backwards. And as an employer, we must create that safe space. We must make everyone feel that they can be their whole self at work, they can bring their whole self to work and be their true selves. And I think actually that's our, our real challenge, is that really to, to lead that from the top, and we talked about the senior role models, but actually the support from the top and actually it being authentic and people being held accountable to actually really make that inclusive environment right through the organisation. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I was reflecting now what, in terms of what DE&I and ESG in particular are now part of modern business practice. Mm. I think there's no getting away where we are in 2022 talking about those two key elements. And I think that's very different having been around this 15 years, where well, we tried the business case the first time around in 2008, and it definitely wasn't lived and breathed. The Equality Act comes through, and we talk about the legal case, and that, that kind of did bring some more traction. But definitely what we start, I feel, what we're starting to see as modern businesses is our two key marketplace, both our clients and our talent, are telling us that this is important to them, and they are not going to choose us as modern businesses if we do not 
make efforts. If we do not make strides, we do not make improvements. Now, that's only in my, my view of my last 15 years, but you know, that's standing on 50 years of, leg of people driving for change, calling it out and making a change. But we have right now the opportunity because in a business, if we don't keep that talent diversifying, we're, we're going to have less talent, less innovation, mm. and we're definitely going to start losing clients if we're not able to, to articulate what we're doing and why we're doing it, not just doing it, doing it because we, we think there's a, we don't know why we're doing it. We have to be articulating that in the right way. Can I come back? Okay, yeah. so I think from the, from the membership body perspective, especially one like RICS, where we have a, a governance and a regulatory aspect to us, um, there's, there's that leadership, um, leadership aspect to it. Uh, we should be leading by example. We should be demonstrating what right looks like as the membership body for all of our stakeholders. Um, and if we're not doing that, we're failing. And that's across the board in terms of the kind of guidance we deliver, the kind of representation we have um, across our organization in supporting and supporting our stakeholders. So yeah, for us, I think it's a holding ourselves accountable and, and like I said, yeah, being able to demonstrate what right looks like if we're expecting our, our firms and our small businesses and our individual members to, to follow a code of ethics and a code of conduct, we have to be showing that we're doing the same uh, internally and externally. So just demonstrate best practice yourself while also applying it externally. Exactly. Which in some ways businesses do because you've got to demonstrate the best practice to your clients, otherwise you're not going to get the contracts through. So you, you touched on the sort of making sure that we keep pe pe the emerging talent. Mm. Uh, I've rephrased that slightly from what you said. Okay. I'm just dragging that into the next question. <laughs> um, but people coming into the industry and, and making sure that it's relevant. What does a young queer person want to see and hear when they look at the built environment to, to join? What is it that's going to make them feel included and accepted? James, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, I mean, I think the first starting point of that is that you need to ask young queer people that question. And that every business who wants to go out and talk and increase the diversity in their, their talent pipeline needs to be engaging with young people right now. Mm. It's no good even myself going and talking on behalf of and a whole next generation about what they might want to be seeing on our website. And, and so that's, that's the main conundrum that I think we all have to grapple with, is how do we work with a young with person our, doesn't look at you and go, I want to Right, you know, I, I like, you, know, you know, and I think where we found success is when we, we work, do our, our youth engagement programs, we have a program with Career Ready, and then we bring them in for a work placement, and then we ask them to tell it, to replay back to us what they think our business is. And it's their language, it's what they're asking, the questions they're asking us about their future careers, which we need to reflect back. Now, some of that is uncomfortable. It is about talking about money and it is talking about things that are important to them right now, which we maybe have never historically talked to when we've talked about talent. Then I think there is also a, a key transparency and integrity that has to come with any time, anything you're talking about. So it is making sure your website and your careers pages are very clear around um, what is the offer? What does the culture look like? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not false. You're not selling a false dream. You really in in have the integrity of what you're doing. And, and we reflected as the, on this last year with our, with our Proud Network and we were talking about a coming out guide. And that coming out guide is something that we, we give to every person who's making an application to us. So they see that before they're even making the choice if we're an employer for them or not. Is it necessarily all the right things to do. Have we got it all right? Probably we've got more work to do in that space, but I think it always has to be centered on, on what that generation is wanting to say to us and finding the inroads to that generation and building that kind of psychological safety so they're gonna tell you uh, is probably the absolute first step. It's kind of what Rico was saying. Um, with, could you, I, I stalked you on LinkedIn because that's what we do. Um, and I saw your dissertation was around Gen Z in the workplace. And that to me was like, of course, we've got to look at how people are moving into the workplace and how we create the environment for people coming in. And the idea that you're saying um, straight white men and having the empathy now and being more empathetic and how that whole equity is changing within the workplace. To, and we as older people need to recognise that what we see as verbatim or what we see as the norm actually isn't anymore. That's our norm, not 
what's happening all down the generations. Sorry, I interrupted. No, I was just gonna, I, I was kind of taking it introspectively on this one and, and thinking about placing myself back in it. And, and prior to um, joining RICS, I, I served 12 years in the US Air Force. And when I had joined as a, as a young officer, fresh out of uh, attending a military school, the don't ask, don't tell policy was still in effect, uh, essentially telling service members they could serve their country, just not be open about who they are as a person. And while I'm cringing internally as I say this uh, to myself, I'm still gonna share it externally. Duty to country outweighed duty to self on, on my decision to still join the service and looking at it and seeing that's a place that's telling me I'm not welcome, but I feel a, a duty to serve anyway. And I think at the very basic premise of this question is creating a built environment where young professionals don't have to choose between duty and self and, and duty of, of society and, or, or whatever that other duty may be that they're you know, associating themselves with. It's looking at the built environment and going, right, I belong there. Like that, that's at the core of all of it. And I don't know that that's there right now. So I think, I mean, I think just following up, so, well, I think a little bit from what James and both have said, I think there's a, uh, what James is talking about in particular in terms of the coming out guide and having that available to people who are applying to uh, CBRE. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. But I think there's, a, there's some work to do about understanding what happens to people before they've even made a decision to mm -hmm. think about applying to CBRE. And so if they make that choice to apply to CBRE, that's incredible what, that, what happens. But what is, what is happening to people who are just absolutely just dismissing, mm -hmm. even looking at CBRE or any of our other organizations, and why is that the case? And I don't think we have a really good handle on what, what that is and why that might be happening. And that's, that's something we really need to understand a lot better. What, what is that attrition rate? What, what's happening in, what does it look like at, uh, on the accredited courses? At all of us as professional bodies have accredited courses in higher education institutes. And what does that look like? Who's on those courses? What does that look like? How is that translating into the, into the actual employer market? And we don't have a really good mm. handle on that across all the diversity characteristics, actually. And it's something that, not to sort of, I don't know if this is the right moment, but six of us, Landscape Institute, Reba, Ricks, ICE, RTPI, we're all coming together and that's one of the critical things we want to work on is trying to get a much clearer picture of what is happening is are people falling out before they've even started mm. and if they are then what do we what do we do about that it's so important to have that that role model that we were yeah. talking about earlier but not I'm just sorry, for people sorry, in Karen, the group and actually just to fit because part of that work that we definitely want to do is to pick up on james question a uh, really important point about asking the people mm. That is what we want to do. We want to try and figure out how can we ask the students who are on these courses, what is it that you need to see or what is it that we need to do to be able to keep you on this path all the way through so we don't lose you to, I don't know, whatever other profession they go into, badminton or whatever. So, so important. I know with the, the Bridge Group did another study in law around social mobility and the number of people that left because they didn't fit in, the, the culture wasn't right for them. Yeah, and I think it's really important to touch on another of Rico's point earlier was around the mental health piece, because schools are so much more accepting now of everyone being who they are, and you, you hear of, you know, friends of teachers, and they have um, pupils called egg or cat or various other um, terms they wish to be known by in, in their lessons, and actually the stat that always um, stuck out for me from the first LGBTQ conference was the number of people that come out in education and then go back in the closet to come to work. So actually, from a mental health point of view, how do we stop that from happening? So again, talking to, to school and university students, colleges, understanding actually how do we make this an inclusive industry and make them feel that they don't have to hide anything, that they can just be themselves. That seems to be the golden egg for the built environment at the moment. How do we attract people from the less dominant culture across the board, because we're all asking the question, and we're, we're and that's the, the great thing about this MOU that you're going to be working together to, to do that. And I think certainly looking at changing the face of property, that collaboration is where the power comes from, and, and that's really what this is about today as well. People are here who aren't RICS members, and that's so important because this is an industry thing, not just a surveying thing. The, 
we've had um, uh, Mark Kapanda is part of the, the network at BNP. Um, I can see a couple of the co-chairs from JLL. And so a number of the organisations have built on that. They've got internal ERGs. How important do those ERGs, or what's the importance of those ERGs in creating an inclusive workplace? I mean, I, I think really, if, if we look at some of the DNI journeys of, of and, and I can honestly say this from CBRE, you know, our ERGs were in were about before our DNI strategies were, so that people were coming together as communities to find that critical mass to share their voice, and they were there before there were formal DNI strategies about. So there is a really important role of those EBRGs recognizing their value in the business, mm -hmm. but also really defining what it is they want and how they're going to go about it. Because it is very different when you have uh, a people function who is driving policy, training, d and initiatives than the people on the ground who are telling you, actually, this is my experience. This is what I'm needing. And for often we can also talk about labor and placing a lot of labor on EBRG. So communities who are already marginalized by your business coming up with the solutions for you to then make for them to then also take through to, to fruition. So for me, I, I think for the value in EBRGs is their, well, their role to create the space where people will come and give you the insights. And I know we talked a lot about data in that last panel, but the flip side of knowing, understanding your diversity data is the particular insights that they can give you, which help you as a business develop your toolbox. So whether that is creating a coming out guide or a carer's policy or a piece of training or a, an internet site which signposts people to the, to the right things, those EBRGs are gold for telling you what that toolbox looks like for the different people. Now, the key thing is, is often the governance can, can really almost get in the way of that. And it's having really great relationships into the people team who, and, and really clear clarity on who's gonna activate something. If an EBRG is identifying a barrier, what is that feedback loop that goes with the people, the people teams or the rest of the business to, to drive, that, um, drive that forward? So, and that can be a real challenge, uh, and that can often be a challenge, but also a point of tension. So for me, the, 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 the big role of the EBRGs is to, to give you the gold. They, they will have a lot of the answers and or identify or be able to diagnose a lot of the barriers, but it's not asking the labor to be placed on them to make the change. I think that's an important point there, because I think there's a danger in, in creating, in groups being created within an organization um, and, and leadership or the organization itself expecting minority groups to advance inclusion for themselves. And I think that happens too often. And I think what you hit on there is perfect, is that those groups, it's finding your, your tribe and the people that you belong to, um, but it's also forming the groups that should be advisors, uh, not the ones doing all of the work to advance the inclusion. They're the advisors on how is it, what's the best approach coming from the people living that experience every single day. Um, but it shouldn't be on organizations going, oh, they have an LGBTQ plus group. They feel included. We're good. You know, like it, it's got to go, the, the whole network has got to, to be supporting those groups once they're created. I think this being a smaller organization, we actually set up a DNI community rather than having separate ESG groups because there's so much intersectionality and in everything. So if, if we're going to review or implement a policy or something to support one group, then actually how does that impact another group and how do we make it truly inclusive for everyone in our workforce? So until we get to a certain size where we can have all the different ESGs, it's actually making sure we've got all the voices of all the different protective characteristics within that room and around that table so everybody has representation. Yeah, representation is key to, to getting that voice heard and the change. And it, looking at so much of the industry the change has been driven by those networks. The, the first change came from Freehold and then from the, the other networks. And, and looking at my experience within the corporate place, it was so much came from, from people wanting to do more and wanting to create that change. But it is the support then of the wider business being able to give them time because, goodness me, that doing something off the side of your desk as so much of this is. And I think that, that actually says a lot about the industry, that when you look at the number of organisations who have a, a defined EDI role, it's, you look at many real, uh, law firms 
and 10, 15 years ago, they had those people in place. And James, you've been, well, I, I knew your predecessors, so you were probably looking at three years ago. Um, and yeah, four years ago for another organization who was the first person. So the intent really needs to come from people with the expertise because you're the people that know how to do it. Whereas when I, at that time, I was a good surveyor and had to learn things. So is there anything that you can say to organizations that are, are leaning on their networks to try and take the pressure off and bring that in into either HR or another part? Where does yeah, they, where I do mean, they if go? there's an organization leaning on their staff, many of them are likely to be junior staff mm -hmm. to change the way the organization runs. I think I would just tell them to stop actually. Um, and not to do that, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work for anybody, not for them and definitely not for the people that they're, they're leaning on other than make them very frustrated, angry, dis dis uh, disappointed and perhaps leave. Um, and so I would say with employee groups, it's the value is very much dependent on the size of organizations so that you reach a particular size they're really useful uh smaller organizations they come slightly less so um really small not very useful at all but they're only as useful as the as the mechanisms that you have for the for the discussions the conversations the insights that are gained in those groups to be taken up by somebody whoever that somebody is and turned into the actual policy or action uh, which is then resourced with people and cash. The two things you never get <laughs> <laughs> when you're working just off the side of your desk, which is more people and money. But that's what's really required. If, 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 if you're not prepared to resource it, it's, not gonna, it's just not going to happen. And whether that, whether, whether that is because you're going you're gonna to now set up um, and I'm going to make a special a kind of a little plea for EDI professionals to an extent, because quite often there's only ever one. <laughs> and that's... What do you mean you can't do it all? <laughs> we can do it all, but we need like a hundred years. But, but that, you know, it's part of the reason why the MOU was signed between these six institutes. Most of us, there is only one. There's one in RICS, there's one in RTPI, there's one at CIOB. We can't... We, have to be able to have more hands to that pump. It's otherwise nothing's going to move. Mm. So I so say, yeah, I would say to these organizations, what are you trying to achieve? Be very explicit, be very directive about what it is you're trying to do. Do you have an actual strategy in place? And then how are these employee resource groups enabling that strategy? Where do they fit? Right? So they shouldn't exist in and of themselves on their own. They have to be part of your actual plan to be able to make a change. And if they're part of your plan, how are they resourced? How are they staffed? How are they supported? Do they, and you have, whether that's somebody from HR, whether that's EDI professional, please try and have a team if you can, <laughs> uh, actually getting in there to, to, mm. to, to keep those wheels turning. And then what is senior management engagement with those staff groups? And what are the other things you're doing? Because it's never gonna work if it's just employee staff groups? Have you got other things in place as well? Do you have uh, allied programs? Do you have, um, I, this, they had this amazing one at Network Rail, which um, I, haven't, I haven't figured out how to implement it anywhere yet, so, where they had, uh, they had a formal program of allyship where people had to, on senior management teams, had to be an, had to be an ally for a characteristic they didn't have. So they had a uh, so sort of straight white man being an ally for LGBT staff. They had uh, able-bodied people being allies for disabled mm. staff and so on. And, that, and they created this really formalized relationship between those staff groups and those allies who then sat on in the decision-making rooms. That's when it really starts to work. So you're... Uh... Yeah, as I say, sort of, we're on a journey towards that, but we've... Um, probably the early stages with reverse mentoring. So all of our DNI community are reverse mentors to our senior leadership team. So the senior leadership team can really understand what it feels like to walk in their shoes. And actually it's really helped them to see things from a really different perspective and actually open their eyes up, probably one step away from becoming an ally, but to really start to think about things very differently around the business. I mean, I chair with our CEO, our, our community, 
um, and the community is supported by the HR and the marketing team because we're conscious that the, the community are free earners and they all have day jobs, but actually, again, it's getting their, their understanding, their knowledge, how they feel, so we can really take that away and make a difference and implement the things to actually support the communities um, across the business. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble now, if I'm being honest, <laughs> because, because I don't love the term ally. I, I, and I, I think it's one of those terms that very often anybody can put their hand up and go, I'm an ally. And I think we've seen a lot of examples over the last five years where different things have ar 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 arisen and we've got, oh, I'm really supportive of that. And then it, it disappears from the spotlight or the forefront of our imagination. And and I think there's a, some, there's a difference between being able to put an ally on and, or being an active ally and that being embedded in your behavior. And, you, and actually when we're active allies, we're advocates. We're not allies anymore. We are going out and being advocates. We're calling out that transphobic joke in the pub. We're calling out that that person who's constantly asking the same person to do the kind of labour, the administrative labour in a team meeting. Be more Leslie. <laughs> so we want to we want to make sure that for me the, the role of I, I'm trying to work my way back around to the, the key point here, but the. Uh, very often we'll ask again that labor to be placed on reverse mentoring programs for EBRGs to come and give their identity, come and give their lived experience so our leaders can become role models. And for me, I think it's, it's important to do that depending on your maturity of your business. But if you are moving forward, how do you reward and recognize that? And how do you make those reverse mentoring, mutual mentoring? How is that person then involved in being sponsored? Is that senior leader coming back and inviting them to future client meetings? Are they bringing them in for uh, projects? Are they able to meet with them and talk to them about their career? Are they going through promotion rounds? Are they coming and doing pre-interviews with them? There is so much that can be unlocked by just connecting more people together. Um, and I think the EBRGs have a really, really golden nugget to do that, mm -hmm. to be bringing the, the, the people with lived experience together with those senior sponsors but then forming a, a kind of new ecosystem that really helps those groups thrive. Yeah, it, it's so much around the, the noun and the verb of ally, isn't it? Sorry, it's like you can call yourself one, but actually be mm. one. I think there was a piece that James said on earlier as well, is, is focusing groups, whether it's an LGBTQ plus group or, or, or a mixed group of, of, of just staff members that want to see things done better. Um, but focusing on objectives and having things that you're trying to get after because, right, everyone has a day job all day that they're getting after. This is a, a side project, um, you know, trying to advance inclusion. But an example within RICS, a, a staff-led task force was created because they saw challenges with creating more diverse panels uh, in the events that we offer for CPD um, and, and our standards team and looking at how they build working groups and those sorts of things. And, and they all saw a common interest and are like, right, let's all come to the table and figure out how we how we do this better. And, and it's not anyone from any particular you know, minority group, it's anyone in the business who's interested in us doing things better, you know, and putting that time aside and, and coming to the working groups and, and hashing it out and, and figuring out what right look should look like for us. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you, you hit on that earlier of just focusing on set targets um, makes that manageable for organizations that don't have EDI, DEI leads, or if you do, it, it help to that one person that mm. can't do it all. So yeah. yeah, as you saw that in over the last two years, with so many budgets being cut and people disappearing from visibility to to actually do something that was so important at that time. Of, so I just sorry on staff groups. Sorry, because the only other thing I would say to people trying to do staff groups is be really mindful about uh, what happens when you have separate staff groups and what, how you bring all of that together. Because if you have a staff group around LGBT, then you have a staff group around Black and Asian colleagues, or, or the, how do you bring those conversations and join them up? People are never just mm -hmm. the one characteristic that they're sitting in a particular conversation around. Uh, and, some, and, we, and people need to be able, right? Inclusion has to be all of that, mm -hmm. not just one element of and so how you bring those together, having that, and that's where having, having a sense of how these things all work in part of part of a strategy or a plan is really important because if you, if you don't have that, you run the risk of creating silo conversations and having, instead of having a conversation about inclusion, you're having conversations about different inclusions which makes no real sense. You end up trying to do events, exactly. yeah. the same you're basic like, content. Oh, well, you're saying, oh, these people are included, in this way, and these are included that way, but what happens if they sit in both? 
Let, let me expand that then. So what are, what are the biggest challenges that we've got to advance in LGBT inclusion in the workplace? Or we can take it to the wider inclusion. But. I, think we, I think we hit on it before. The first thing that comes to mind is the people that aren't in this room. Um, the biggest challenge is that we're often talking at each other in an echo chamber when we're all in the same all in the same boat wanting to head in the same direction, but we're missing some really key passengers. Um, and how do we get those passengers on board with us? Um, I, I think until we get organizations, the larger society, uh, but in, you know, with what we have touch points to, what we have you know, some level of control on the organizations that we're in, how do we get everyone on board? I think that is gonna to continue to be our biggest challenge because if people aren't having those lived experiences of discrimination and bias and whatever else, um, then they don't think they need a seat at the table, but they do. And, and how, do we, how do we inspire that? Uh, you know, I'd be, I think I might be slightly more aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do sometimes wonder, is it how do we get these people who don't want to join the bus, how do we get them on the bus? Or actually, how do we just get them to move out of the way? Because, you know, like we can, you can spend a huge, exert a huge amount of energy trying to convince somebody to do this thing. Um, and actually, maybe it's better to just actually let's, you don't want it, that's fine, but this bus is leaving. <laughs> and you can either be on it or not. Yeah. And if you're not on it, when we get to the destination, that's, your, that's, that's on you. So much more on the KPIs that people are bringing in, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? It's like, well, you're either part of this, yeah. we're going to measure it, you'll be rewarded if you hit it, and if you don't, yeah. it sucks to be you. Yeah, um, well, I, mean, yeah I might not say it sucks to be you, but <laughs> <laughs> I might say it's definitely better to be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that you, you touched on there, it's that link to, to reward as well, actually, if you're going to put uh, targets in place, you've actually got to be measurable. So it goes back to the data, you need to know where you're starting, are the initiatives you're doing making a difference? And if not, what do you need to change about those initiatives? And actually, if you've got your blockers or your obstructions in the road, actually, how are they penalised? Because if they're not going to change their, their thoughts or their behaviour or their engagement into those initiatives, how do we, we encourage them with the, with the carrot <laughs> of money to, to, you know, to do that? So we are actually looking at measuring um, through, through reward in terms of that engagement with the policy. But I also think we touched on it earlier. I think we've just got a bigger challenge as an industry, as the built environment. How do we actually change the view of the world looking in on us mm. and say, actually, we are a truly inclusive place. Come and work with us. And it goes back to a number of things we touched on about talking to school children and actually trying to just repaint the image of our industry. Just pulling you back on to that reward point, because as larger organisations, that, that's something you can do. But somebody goes, well, OK, if I need to be inclusive, I, I'm not going to work here anymore. I'm going to go and work over here with this organisation that looks like me, speaks like me, has all of my values, which is very small compared or very narrow minded. How can, and perhaps this is one for the professional bodies, how do you then hold these people to account of staying in a, in a mindset that is a very fixed mindset and how do you move them into that growth mindset? Um, and, and examples that come to mind first on this one are just from that regulatory perspective. We have rules of conduct and if you're not following them, then you can be reported and lose that membership status. Um, the example that Chris used in his opening remarks this morning, just last week, we had a fellow, you know, senior member in the organization resign his membership because we put the LGBTQ flag up and we accepted his resignation. You know, like, okay, yeah, mm. happy to see you go then in that situation because that's that's not what we're about. Those aren't our values. Um, so I think it's a it's a mix of you have to do the, the hard bit of regulatory actions when necessary because um, preaching about values doesn't always sink in and get through to people, but actions do. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes the hammer has to come down. Um, but then yeah, just holding ourselves accountable as well um, in that situation. 
um, and making sure we're in a position to hold other people accountable um, is really important. Yeah, I, th I, mean, I, think it, I think I said it earlier, we used to set clear, very clear expectations um, about what, is, what, is, what we're expecting people to do, what we're expecting people, how we're expecting people to behave. Um, we also have to back that up with uh, very clear uh, sets of resources, training, whatever the case may be that might help people to be able to, to do that. Not everybody may be able to, you know, what language to use and maybe some, how can we help you around that kind of stuff. And we, and we can do all of that. But I think also we have to just, we have a point where it's like, we're going to do all of this, but you've got to do this work. And it's going to be on them. And yeah. I think the other thing we do is make it, you know, we create collectively, I think, with employers, but as professional bodies with our members and as professional bodies working together, we create, we work to create the type of conditions which kind of polices that type of behavior out mm. one way or another. Either because, and you know, this is, this is the problem with this kind of stuff is that in some, some people are going to come to this and be inspired by it and be a different type of a person and behave differently because they recognize it's, a, it's the right thing to do. Other people are going to do it just because they think there's a paycheck attached to it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, which is the, the kind of reward thing is, okay, that's fantastic. But if, if they know what they're doing it because there's a financial gain to it, they may not, they may not agree with this at all. Mm. <laughs> so much that <laughs> but, <laughs> Right, but actually, if I do it, I'm going to get my paycheck will look better. Yeah. And that, now that, that's, that's not necessarily, you know, so they may be doing the thing we want them to do, but they may be doing no, it for the reason we want them to do it. And that, you know, how do we manage? Do we have to think that through as well? And what, what happens? And because they may do it in work, which is grand, and maybe all our colleagues that we work with don't feel the wrath of that action, those act behaviors anymore. But once they, when they go on Twitter and uh, black football and this is the penalty, they go crazy again, right? So that, you know, and that's not, that's not behavior we want either. Mm -hmm. So it's, that we have, to, we, have to, we have to really think about that. So actually, how do we create, we can do all of these things, but all of that has to build up eventually in, in the end to a kind of way in which we all are collectively operating, which polices this behavior out. Yeah. Going to come to you. <laughs> think of questions. We're going to come to questions. <laughs> so next up is you, James. I, mean, I, I Slightly controversial. I think, I think if you're getting to the point where someone's deciding to be a in your employment or not because of your diversity approach it's a litmus test of how much you're actually delivering as a business we shouldn't be getting to a point where you have your purpose as a business is, is so different to the, the people who work there that they're, they're threatening to go to a competitor because of your dni approach so, and that needs a whole ecosystem behind it that yeah. that's not any one kind of training a, a kpi put on a personal objective it actually needs everything to happen at the same time so that person is is they've got the 360 support platform um stick carrot <laughs> you know there to ensure that they are part of that purpose mm -hmm. and our organizations and most modern businesses becoming purpose-led organizations this is probably the biggest shift that's happening at the moment um is that businesses aren't putting up with it businesses aren't putting mm -hmm. up they know they can't cooperate it anymore it is controversial when you have high fee earners and you're talking about okay how do we how do we look at those behaviors now in this new uh, environment that we're in um, how are we then just making sure that we're justifying that back to our client base our talent base who are who are either experiencing it or want to know what we're doing in the space so I think it's it, it, it is the litmus test of what is your investment as a business to make sure you're not getting to that test and how are you actually get how are you actually in, in, embodying that as an organization and and there's some things that have been talked about role models and i think that I, I i much prefer the term real models like if mm. you're an organization of purpose what are the real models who are on your business they don't have to be ceos and they don't have to be senior leadership they can be anywhere in your business and um, the other aspect of this is up to 80 percent of your business will be line managing people a lot of our inclusion work is about just being human and being kind to other people and half the time when i talk to people this is this is fundamentally what we're solving is how does somebody take an interest in someone as a human and ensure that they've got the environment that they can thrive where they are right now. Mm -hmm. And some of that is how they are talked to or the circumstances in which they want to operate. And it's, it's, it's really important for us that you can't make people mean it when it comes to in inclusion. Some people will believe it, some people won't, but you can be an organization that has standards and has an, an expectation mm -hmm. and has a purpose. Thank you. Right then, who's up? Thank you. <laughs> 
Hello. Um, sorry, another journalist here. Sorry about that. Um, the, big, the big word here is fear. On the word cloud, there's two of them were fear of coming out and fear of being excluded. That's from the, the LGBTQ kind of community. But the, the big fear here is from the allies or advocates, choose your choose term. Um, where are we creating the safe spaces for them to ask the well-meant but stupid question? Because that's how strong we have to be as an industry to move forward. So I, I think it's a really important, the psychological safety doesn't just go to people who are marginalized by your business already. It's going to everybody who wants to be part of that journey. I have a, I like to use, I have a PhD knowledge of what it's like to be a gay rugby player. That's my, I don't know what that's like. I've experienced that the whole time. But I've had a face those homophobic abuses on the pitch. What I don't know what it's like is to be a trans woman entering into our real estate sector. So the important space is to understand that there is a difference. I have a nursery level ed education of what that is. How do we create those spaces where people can come together, ask those questions, but ask them in a way that isn't just taking the labor of those with lived experience. And also saying that this is not just gonna be conversations, but there, there is so many resources out there now. The easiest thing is just to go and ask somebody who you think is of a marginalized group and say, oh, can you just tell me, tell me your life story so I can, can advance my knowledge here without putting that labor in yourself. And that is where I think we form the, the problem spaces. If you, if you are, we're asking leaders to go and, and be inquisitive, go and ask the questions, but we need to equip them with skills. And those skills are, how do you ask those questions <laughs> in a way that allows you not to offend somebody, means you're giving back, you're recognizing what's that gift that someone's given you, which is their experience. And then what are you doing with that to go forward? And I think for me, the key area of that is that you can set those spaces up. The EBRGs can set those spaces up. You as organizations, small, small working groups, small talking circles, book clubs. There are so many informal social spaces where a cup of tea, you know, it, it can happen where you can build that learning. But you have to build it with trust. You can't just go and pick a random member from the office block and go, right, can we have a cup of tea, please, and talk about your lived experience. It's got to be built on trust. Um, and I think, again, it's that approach of approaching it with kindness rather than a kind of, uh, I must do, must do. Yeah, an example we have within RICS is another staff-led initiative. Um, our staff are making my life really easy now. It's amazing. Um, but we have a staff-led inclusion group, um, and, and they do a great job of bringing in guest speakers, whether it's another staff member who wants to speak about their experience or someone external to the organization, and they'll welcome them in. Uh, to talk about their experiences and then there is that open Q&A session it is a safe space it's voluntary to join the inclusion group doesn't matter who you are um, where you're from um, and it gets sent out to all of staff to choose whether or not they want to be a part of that or not um, but they've been really really great forums the ones I've sat in um, really constructive conversations and it it is you know coming from that place of here's a safe space there is no dumb question you know let's talk about it um, so I think yeah like James is saying, just the more organic it is, the better, because then there's automatically that trust factor. So I'm going to disagree slightly with my colleague. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I get slightly vexed with this question about safe space for people to ask stupid questions, because uh, when you get asked these kind of stupid questions, it is exhausting. And actually, you, we're talking about a safe space in a professional context to, be, to ask these stupid questions. If you're one of these groups, you get asked, you could be asked these stupid questions in any context, at any time, multiple times a day. It is exhausting. And I, 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 I don't think, it, and I g genuinely don't think it's on, it's on the minority group to have to, to figure out how we make somebody feel comfortable. So we have to figure out every day <laughs> how we can feel comfortable just getting to work, let alone what happens when we actually got to work and on the way home from work and so on. So I think my response there is actually, what is the investment in expertise that these people really want to make? Because if you, get, if you make an investment in expertise, it's a really interesting, uh, well, I don't want to speak for civil, but from my point of view, it's quite an interesting little thing that happens in my head when I'm operating in the spaces in a professional context with the EDI hat on and the people I have are, there, are therefore engaging me on, with, as an expert with a level of expertise, which is a really different type of conversation with, hey, can I touch your hair, right? Which is the kind of thing has, that has happened. So do you know what you're right? So, but actually, that, 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 
engaging me with an expert creates a kind of safeness for me, which means they can, I can engage in a particular way. And I think that would be my pushback. Actually, make an investment in some expertise, and then you can ask all the questions of your expert that you want. I think that's why I think their approach is appropriate, because they're asking people if they're willing to be the person that's sitting in that hot seat. Um, and, and speaking to that, answering that. Yeah, so, and I'm, just, I'm really just making a massive distinction yeah. between a member of staff who might be sitting in a group because they're, mm -hmm. they're conscientious and they're committed and they're passionate. And that's a really different thing from somebody like me who's being paid to be in that position. But it's, it's a really different, and I just, yeah, I just get a little bit, ah, no. I'd much rather engage with an expert and ask that question. And then you'll, get, you'll, you'll actually ask that question in a different way as well, right? Because if you ask me a question as a person, then you're going you're to ask that in a really particular way. And if you're going to ask me that as an expert, you're going to ask that in a slightly different way. And that is the better way to ask that question, whatever that question is. And by the way, it's always no, you cannot touch my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things we've done, which have sort of done a lot of things we've done at Seabury, obviously, but um, is we created a glossary. We put that on our internet. Um, so that people could go and actually have a read and, and go and explore for themselves. And we've created a lot of content that people from all across the different backgrounds, whether it's about Diwali or it's about how they personally felt about the Euros, racism, we've, we've put the stories on there so people can really read and understand. Uh, it didn't dawn on me, for example, that a number of our black community wouldn't even have dreamt of going to the pub to watch the football. I didn't even think about that. I just thought, where do I want to watch it? And actually, it comes back to this privilege. How do we help everyone understand that but without necessarily putting people in the question, line of questions every day, but to share that, that knowledge? Sam, I can see you've got the microphone. Um, I just want to go back to a point of um, ask the expert, don't just ask oh, yeah. any, anyone. But, you know, there's a lot of businesses within the built environment that don't have the, the privilege of having an expert. And there are probably a lot of stupid questions in those smaller companies that don't have the privilege of having an expert. So how do we, how do we deal with, with that part of the equation? Well, I think that's where people like Sybil and I really should come in because it's what we, part of what we have to be able to do. And I think coming back to what I was saying at the beginning is how can we think about those organizations which are gonna to be too small, maybe 10 members of staff, 20 members of staff, whatever the case may be, and they're not gonna have, and it may not even make sense for them to have an expert DEI program, may not even have an HR department. But that's where people like Sybil and I can actually start to, you know, we should be, more, maybe we need to be slightly more visible, that's something on us, but we, yeah, how could, that's where we can start to fill in some of that, do some of that stuff. There's a couple of questions. You know? Should have done it by interpretive dance, I think. <laughs> it's not so much of a question, but more of a comment. And just a huge thank you for recognizing how exhausting <laughs> this work really is and how it does fall upon the people who are most affected by the lack of representation. So I just want to thank you for giving voice to that as somebody who is exhausted. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, you mentioned about 60% um, of graduates going back into the closet after they start work. I mean, for me, definitely, I did. Um, because you never know, you can never predict that reaction. What advice would you give to a graduate? What questions should they be asking when they're entering the workplace? Um, I suppose more of the likes of CBRE and RLB, I guess, aimed at you guys. I, I, so, so I think it's it's very much about what it, how am I going to feel when I go into that workplace? What is that workplace going to look like? How am I going to be? What are the what is the kind of environment looking like? What is the social aspect looking like? I think the so we I sometimes one of the biggest things I've seen moving into this sector is the role of the social space in this sector is huge, and, and, but in both positive and negative ways. And I think it's important to kind of ask those questions about what sort. If somebody's confident enough to do that in that interview process, which is not an easy thing to do, what support would I get as a gay man if I was coming through this process? We found some really great traction working with our next generation and our network, coming together really closely, having a next generation rep on the board of that network to be to telling us about exactly what should we be saying to somebody who's going through that recruitment process right now. 
and we've been looking at we do a little marketplace we're looking at marketplaces quick virtual marketplaces to talk about those networks so they're almost as you're making those decisions what is it the activities that those networks are doing what is the social connectedness what's the professional development so i think it's 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 being inquisitive back to the business going you you have the power in choosing the company you want to work with so what is it that you want or what does the toolbox want to look like when you get there and i think more and more particularly the generations who are coming through the graduate programs now they are more happy to not to not take on your take on your graduate program if they're not going to be thriving there and i think the confidence you can give somebody in that process to ask those questions also means you're going to know what we should be telling people how we should be uh, marketing those roles how we should be check if you know if our culture is right you know yeah i mean i think you're far more advanced than we are i mean we sort of Look at the we want to set everybody up to succeed so we're not sort of distinguishing or, or we have no specific guides for any um protective characteristic coming into the business but we're trying to position ourselves as the employer of choice for that's an inclusive welcoming and whoever you are and whatever you believe in we're setting you up to succeed um so yeah we probably need to to go and do some research really uh, i think and and to get some learnings I think as well, it's about the real models. It's that it's about you're not you're just you're constantly rolling out your leadership to come and do those set up those events. It's about more empowerment to more people to kind of tell their stories. Mm -hmm. That real models piece is really really important. And yeah, we 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 do only send graduates and an apprentice out because you've no interest in hearing from me. <laughs> so it's we do, we try to make it real, so you can actually what is and ask the questions. What is it really like to work there? Not what does the website say? What does the marketing? What do we say on our grad stand? Um, what is it really like? Thank you. I'm conscious that we're running over a little bit. Um, so with that, I'm going to come to each of you for one last... Uh, well, what do, you, what do you want to leave people with? How are we leaving the room with the, the idea of how do we advance LGBT inclusion for professionals? I don't know, but it wants to start. <laughs> I think for me as an employer and having been passionate about diversity and, and real estate, for, I've worked in real estate for over 12 years, it's, I'm really excited to hear as professional bodies that you are joining up and actually you are really going to work with us all as employers because actually, particularly um, in RLB, we have members probably of nearly all of the six of you that have joined together. So actually to have you working with us and supporting us and having a joined up approach the built in um, environment is going to be so powerful to really make that difference. So, so I, I mean, I think for me, that it, it's, it's the continual, the continual advancement that we can talk about the acronym, we can talk about policies, we can talk about diversity profiles, but every, there's every, a person behind every mm. incident, there's a person behind every job application. So it, it's, it's very much trying to, to take that human based design, human based approach. And what is that toolbox that everybody needs in their business? what is it that we are doing to make our businesses purposeful and led and so that somebody doesn't have to ask for a coming out guide when they enter an organization because they actually we already we're already talking about it in a really open and honest way um it's a long time to do that but i think it's it's, it's really for me it's just remembering it, it at the core of this is it's, it's people it's, it's mm -hmm. people at the at the core of this i think for me success is going to be not just the joining together of of the professional bodies, but the how do we how do we get everyone together in the, working in the DEI space to collaborate and agree on the collective way forward? Because there's a lot of greatness happening in individual organizations and a lot of not greatness happening in others. How do we get everyone on the same page across the board, working to the same standard? Um, that that's the, the place I want to get to. We we're getting there with with the MOU for us as as membership bodies delivering our, our action plan in July for what that looks like. And I would love to see organizations across the sectors doing the same thing, like changing the face of property is coming together and going, right, DEI, like sustainability, is not a space we can afford to work in our silo. We have to break down those competitive walls and all get after the same things together, how we standardize data, how we, how we standardize benchmarks. If we're all doing the same thing, then anyone, professional, individual, can go across any sort of organization and expect the same level of respect uh, and and yeah inclusion across the board. That's the ideal end state. Are we, <laughs> that's, yeah. um, so I'm just quickly sorry it's really 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 bad. But the question about uh, 
applying for a job, I would always say, remember, you can ask a question. In any interview, there you have a moment in the interview where the employer asks, gives you the opportunity to ask them a question, use those questions to understand. That's your opportunity to grill them and get information back. And you can pull out. If they don't give you the answer you want, you can say, no, I don't want to work here. That's totally fine. Um, so, but in terms, I think, in terms of this inclusion, I think uh, we need to get, we, to, to get to the point in the end where we're not talking about inclusion as a set of actions that we do, but as a value that we have. Yeah. And that it's, it's part of our values as a business, as a sector, as a profession, whatever. Because when, it's, when, it, when we reach that point, it start, it, the decisions, it, in, it makes the decisions easier. We make value-based decisions. And if, we, if, we are, if we're operating as value-based businesses, inclusions should be one of those values. I think that sums it up perfectly. I will just say that at the end of the International Women's Day, somebody came up to me at the, the end of the, the panel and said, I never thought I'd see a lesbian on stage. Well, today you've had a stage full of lesbian, gay, trans people, bisexuals. We've been here, RICS have given us this space and let's use this now to move on and create the change. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. We did have closing remarks lined up from, from David Mann, one of the co-founders of, of Freehold, but unfortunately he was ill this morning and was not able to join us today, so you're stuck with me. Hey. Um, one thing that stuck with me actually was uh, Sam brought up the infamous wall behind us. Um, and I felt the same thing hosting International Women's Day uh, here as I do today, um, where you, you pointed out if we could put identities next to every single one of these names, or even just photos next to every single one of these names, we would understand why we're here um, having these events, having these conversations. Um, you know, even just in the names, you see the first woman doesn't show up until 2014 out of this 150 your legacy we have here as a chartered institute. So um, I wish we did have images next to it. So it's a constant reminder every time we come in this room that we have work to do and we owe it to every member of this organization to make that wall look different. Um, so thank you for showing up today. That's what we need more of is people committing to showing up um, and expect to hear a lot more from us. Um, oh, I saw this thank you slide that popped up that prompts me. There is, it's not just me, it's not just the people on these panels that pulled this together today. Behind the scenes, there were actually a lot of organizations. Uh, and we sat in a lot of meetings talking about what are the key things we need to talk about today and, and what that should look like. So a huge shout out and thank you to the organizations you see there. Um, I'm gonna miss one if I try and list them off. So just look at the slide. Um, but. Thank you all for tuning in uh, online as well. Um, I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, and then for everyone here in the room, please uh, join us in the room next door uh, for some beverages and to stretch the legs. Uh, thank you.